My guest tonight is a PGA DFS shark, uh, DFS shark in general, uh, in, in the olden days. Now, these days, mostly just plays PGA. That's probably what you know him for as a PGA shark. He's won $50,000 just last week in PGA showdown. I know he won $20,000 about a month or two ago, uh, on his birthday. So just keeps, keeps crushing in PGA. He also runs the website cut sweats where i go to learn that all my lineups are dead immediately as soon as i enter them other people might go to cut sweats to learn that their lineups uh, actually look good i'm sure there are those people out there as well who actually look good on cut sweats uh he is nelson adcock you can find him on twitter at nelson adcock you can find his DraftKings FanDuel username is next world champ uh, missing all the vowels except for the last a nelson we got the masters coming tomorrow how how busy are you how, how are you doing tonight I'm doing fine. I'm trying to uh, get some lineups created, uh, and it's taking a little bit longer than normal. <laughs> Nelson told me what three and a half hours you were simming before, like before the show. You've already been simming your lineups, or or simming the golfers for three and a half hours. Yeah, I well, yeah, I I, I expanded the process a little bit. I'm doing um, quite a few more sims. I'm not sure it's really necessary, other than some of the bigger contests. Um, so that's certainly one thing I need to tweak. Is like. Uh, build a bunch of sims but if it's a small contest you certainly don't need to sim it um you know a quarter million yeah. times so right. you know i some tweaks to the process can certainly be made but i was trying to uh get it started before i ran out to dinner with the kiddos so i was like all right i'm just gonna fire it off and come back and see what happens uh as i noted you just won fifty thousand dollars last week in pga showdown now we have the masters where we have hundred dollar milli two thousand dollar milli Ten dollar milli. How how much of that money are you putting right back in action? Yeah, um, you know, uh, probably about a few thousand on the classic okay. slate, but I'm only playing the ten dollar milli. Um, okay, okay, not. That's I right. think you, I have you a don't ticket. really play the. Yeah. Now I don't. I don't really play um, a ton of classic golf. Um, you know, there's no real reason to it other than the variance in classic golf is, um, in my opinion, infinitely larger than the variance in um, showdown. So it's sort of a, you know, correlated relationship in that the players are probably better at PGA showdown, um, but then the field sizes are smaller. So you can realize your equity um, a little bit easier. Whereas for classic, I think that people play worse, but you know, you're, you get what 50 slates in a year i mean that's in, that's that's totally nuts i've had i just last year probably uh 200 or 250 slate break even streak for pj showdown so um that's five years of classic entries and right. that's in much smaller fields where i have um you know a lot more win equity than you know a hundred thousand dollar classic contest or a fifty thousand person classic contest. So it's sort of a, um, you know, I just, I just don't put a lot of effort into it just because it seems hard to realize the equity. So you're, when you say you've been doing Sims for hours, are these Sims that you can apply to both showdown and to, uh, to, to the main contest? Or are you just Simeon for the classic contest? Yeah. So that, that's just, that's just the classic. Um, okay. so I have like, I, I, for classic, I'll create a Sim for each player. You know, however, you know, I think this time I did a, it's overkill. I did a quarter million for each player. So for the classic slate for each player, I have 250,000 outcomes um, and then run the contest, you know, depending on which contest I'm playing, I'll run that through the um, simulation and see, okay. you know, what I think the best lineups are for that contest. Um, but you really jump showdown, right into this, didn't we? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for like showdown, I mean, I think tomorrow's showdown is like, uh, maybe 6,000 entries or something like that. Okay. So, you know, it's, I think a probably decent rule of thumb is if you have um, 10 times as many Sims as lineups in the contests, you're probably, you know, doing okay as far as getting a large enough sample. So if, you know, 50,000, 60,000 Sims for showdown will be enough. Um, right. Which, you know, it's kind of, you know, just to think about the variance in PGA DFS, I mean, I've played like 600 slates in the last year or last year and a half. And I'm like, oh, well, 
you need probably at least 60,000 sims to even make it make sense. And I've played a solid 1% of that in real life. So right. um, it's just crazy variance. Yeah, that's, that is how I explain my down streak. It's just crazy variance. It's not because I don't have any idea what I'm doing in PGA DFS. It's just the, the damn crazy variance. Um, all right, we're, we're going we're gonna to get back to your process. So I want to dive a little bit deeper. But I do like to start with some some softball get-to-know-you kind of questions. Uh, and we, we actually had TGH already asked a question here, and I don't know to what extent you want to share. But uh, I'll start with just where are you from? Where do you live now? And do you have any favorite teams, favorite athletes? Yeah, uh, I grew up in Virginia. Um, uh, then I went to Clemson, uh, met my wife, my now wife at Clemson. She's from uh, the Atlanta area. And where, I where actually is Clemson? Sorry. Uh, ju- it's about two hours north of Atlanta, just in okay. sort of western South Carolina. Gotcha. Um, okay. So um, if you're familiar with Greenville, South Carolina, um, it's about an hour from there. Um, okay. So I've been in South Carolina um, since I graduated college. I mean, I've been in Atlanta since I graduated college. Okay. Um, yeah. So that that's sort of my background of sports. Um, I used to play um, baseball was my big sport growing up. I played all the sports, but um, baseball was a big sport for me. Um, I have been to Minnesota one time for um, I played AAU baseball back in the day. Okay. And when we were 12, um, the national uh, championship tournament was in Minnesota. And uh, we came in second and we lost the national championship game 24 to 3. So that was a thrilling experience. Cool. Was that the only game you played in Minnesota or do you play the whole tournament here? The whole tournament was there. So we traveled there. Okay. I don't, so it I wasn't all probably, a bad experience. Yeah, it's, it's like a it's like a March Madness. Uh, okay. I don't know, like 50 or 60 teams show up. And then you kind of go in, I think, I don't know, I think it was like pool play. And then if you make it out of your pool, you go play, 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 play. And we ended up playing um, this team from San Diego or California. We were a okay. team from Virginia, um, probably. Played against Petty, ever, probably. Yeah. Yeah. I think we're about the same age. So yeah. it's, it's not totally out of the realm of possibility. But we were a team from Virginia, uh, probably had approximately, everyone we lived within 20 miles of each other, I would say, at least, probably tighter than that for most people. Okay. Um, but when this team we played from California was really the best players from the entire state of California. So yeah, that's unfair. I remember we, of California, I, I, my God, that's a big we were, we were, I was 12, I was, I'm taller now, I'm, I'm average height now, you know, just about six feet. Um, but at the time I was small, and I remember um, the shortstop they had. I came up to the bottom of his number on his jersey. <laughs> oh, God. He was like 6'2 at 12. And wow. uh, I distinctly remember the very first inning I'm playing center field, and we have a good pitcher on the mound. And he throws this kid just a wicked curveball, fooled him pretty badly. And he was off balance on his front foot, and he flicked his wrist. He must have hit it 400 feet to right field and i was like this is gonna be a long game yeah. and it it was yeah it does not sound not sound ideal uh do you remember where in minnesota you were um yeah minneapolis we went to the okay. like mall of georgia and we did all that all that sort of stuff but there was a there was a couple of baseball complexes um the mall of america that, and well i mean around that area that okay. the tournament was sort of hosted i think there was like a handful of sites that depending on what day it was, you got to schedule, Hey, your, your team's playing here on this field or whatever it was. Okay. Um, first of all, we, we can answer the question about your hat because we already, we already talked about the hat before. Cause I had the same question. What is that hat? Uh, can you explain the hat for? Yeah, TGH? it's a, it's a, it's a goat. That is a tiger. So should be uh, yeah. self-explanatory. Yeah. Yeah. Tiger, this, yeah. tiger goat hat. Yeah. That guy. That's, that's a yeah. great shirt. That's a great shirt. <laughs> Um, it, is a, it is a great shirt. So you say now that you are, you live in Atlanta, but you live like in the suburbs of Atlanta. I guess I didn't realize that Atlanta was right on the border. So you're technically in South Carolina. No, no, no. I'm no, oh. yeah, I'm no. I mean, I'm in, I'm in um, Georgia. So I'm a. Uh, oh, you are okay. So, yeah, for me to get to downtown Atlanta, based you know depending on traffic. I mean, I work just north of the city, probably at the north perimeter. So 
to get into downtown Atlanta for me is like um, 30 minutes on, you know, light traffic, you know, 45 minutes or an hour if it's like rush hour. Wait, so have you ever, I, I can't remember, you said, have you ever lived in South Carolina or is that just a joke? Yeah, yeah. Clemson's in South Carolina. Oh, Clemson's so, in South Carolina. College. Okay. Gotcha, yeah, yeah. gotcha. Okay. I think that's a, a reference to a feud I had. Um, I remember, I remember the feud ago. Uh, about, about rural South Carolina. Yeah, I remember yeah. that bit, but I, I didn't realize, I, I assumed that you did actually live somewhere in South Carolina. Uh, I did not realize that you actually live in Atlanta. And, and you said your, your wife is from the area where you live now. Yeah, around yeah she's from, okay. she's from Atlanta, so. We moved here, or I moved here after school. I was, um, I played poker for a living after college, so um, I could go really wherever I wanted to. Then they shut that down, so that was fun. I think you might have answered this already, and I'm already forgetting it. Uh, do you say you have any favorite teams or athletes? Um, so going up, baseball was my thing. So yeah. um, Griffey was my oh, uh, yeah. all time favorite player by far, and I played center field. We both played center field, so. Um, that he was a huge, I mean, the Seattle Mariner team back in like the mid nineties was like my, my dream team with, yeah. uh, you know, they had Griffey and Randy and, um, Ed A-Rod. Rod. Yeah. Jay Buhner. Yeah. yeah. Um, for, you know, there, I, there was a, we used to play this video game. Was it called bottom of the ninth? It was an old, I think it was on Sega maybe. Right. If you, I mean, people are like, what are these game things you guys are talking about? <laughs> right. but, yeah. Um, I don't remember. I, we, I would that. always play with the Mariners, and we found this glitch in the game where Rich Amaral, who was like this, like just utility guy for the Mariners, would just hit clutch home runs all the time, and it was just it was the funniest thing. <laughs> that so, that is a great. Um, Did you play on was, Tecmo Super Bowl at all? I guess no, that that no. was Nintendo. That was not. Saturday. Yeah, that was Nintendo. We played a ton of Ken Griffey Jr. baseball, which was on Nintendo sixty four. Um, me and mm-hmm. my brother, um, and then. You know, we were both smaller. Um, you know, we're both average height, average size now. But all like growing numerous. up, we were very small. Yeah, like I think I was uh, when I entered junior year of high school, I was five flat or maybe less. Um, you and, and I so had the exact we, opposite experience, and I'm, je- were, I'm jealous of you. That you, you were an early bloomer. bloomer. I was. I was. I was in seventh grade. I was about the same height. I think I was probably five ten. I'm five eleven now. I had a full goatee in seventh grade. A kid came up to me. I, I played basketball on the seventh grade team and a kid for, or no, uh, a coach, a coach, the opposing coach one day came up to me and started talking to me, like asking me questions about the team and stuff. And it came, I, it took me a little while to realize he thought that I was the coach of my seventh grade basketball team because I was so, <laughs> so much taller than everybody else and also had uh, a goatee already. So uh, yeah, that, I, that I wish that I could have had story. your experience of like going from the like little pipsqueak to like growing to be a full man height uh, over the course yeah. of high school. But no, I was I was done basically in seventh grade. Um, so that's, c- that's congrats on the growth spurt. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, so I played um, baseball. I played all sports up until probably I was age ten. Then it was like specifically baseball from ten to thirteen, fourteen. Travel. I mean, we were playing eighty games a year. I think. Um, and then I sort of got burned out and then I was just, by the time we were like sort of entering high school, I was just so small. I was on the small end. Um, I just couldn't keep up with the guys that were, you know, huge. Um, and I had a grandfather who had introduced me to golf and, and I, you know, played recreationally pretty much since I was two. Um, he would take me to the range. Like he lived, he backed up to a driving range. So when I was younger and my brother would nap, he would like, we would sneak over to the range and go hit balls. And um, he passed away when I was like in 10th grade or something like that, I guess. And really after that, I just started, I focused on golf and, um, you know, played golf, mostly did some, you know, travel golf, Um, was fairly good, I would say, junior year of high school. And then uh, if anyone from the mid Atlanta, you know, from the Virginia area, there's the PGA is sectioned off into like these different sections. So like okay. Georgia's big, it's got its own section of the PGA, the PGA of America, like all the golf professionals, um, Virginia lives in or resides in the mid Atlantic section of the PGA, which is like Virginia. And I think it's just Maryland, maybe, maybe Delaware. I can't remember. Um, and so there was like a mid Atlantic 
their uh, junior tour, golf junior tour that I had played on and had done fairly well on. And I had, since my grandfather died, I had used his clubs. He had like these big Bertha graphite shaft clubs. And um, I got really good with using those golf clubs. And then I got some jobs at a golf course. And finally, I got to know like the head pro at the golf course I was working at. He was like, hey, you know, I'm, you know, I'll get you some golf clubs for cost if you want to do that. Um, so, yeah. you know, so, you know, what retail on golf clubs is probably twice as much as they cost, sometimes even more. So I was like, oh, great. I can get a new set of clubs for, you know, not that much money. Um, so I did that. I got some steel shafts in the clubs. That was the first time I ever had steel shafted golf clubs, which are a little heavier. Mm -hmm. And I've kept playing well. And then I was practicing one day in the summer, like for this call, like I had qualified for like this year in tournament. So I was practicing for it. And my left wrist just like gave out in the middle of practice. Oh, and shit. I remember I, I shanked one for the first time in my life. And I was like, what the heck was that? And it like sort of hurt my wrist. And then I proceeded to shank like the next 30 balls for like 45 minutes. And then I was, you know, my wrist had just, I get, I think I just had like tendonitis or, you know, my wrist just basically gave out. And I, how old were you again? What was that? So this is like junior year of high school or when was this? Yeah. 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 Junior okay. year. I think like I probably had like a scoring average, like in the low seventies junior year. Um, and then I had the injury and then I golf was in the fall and I injured my wrist in the summer. And I was like, well, I'm not just not going to play golf season. Do you, do you know what the price. injury was? Like, did you put a name to it other than just like your wrist gave out? Like, was it? I think I think or? technically tendonitis would be okay. like the most the most. I never got like die like it literally when I would play golf and I would like swing down. It literally felt broken. Like it it hurt so much. And but it was funny. That was like the only thing that hurt my wrist was to swing huh. a golf club. Interesting. Um, so it was probably just overuse and. I think it was related to the weight of the clubs that I had switched to. Sure. Um, I was just kind of a small guy, wasn't maybe ready for it, or I took it on too quickly. And uh, so that sort of, you know, ruined um, any prospects of going further in golf generally. Okay. So, th so that was kind of the end for you. What was junior and high school? I mean, I, I was able to play pretty well. I mean, I think like uh, freshman, you know, freshman year, I think after after my first year at Clemson, um, I played really good that summer. Um, I was probably like a, a plus two handicap or something like that. And uh, I remember I wrote the Clemson coach. I was like, hey, you know, do you guys even have like an open trial that I could just come, you know, mess around? And I think basically got laughed at. And so that was okay. <laughs> that was as, as close as uh, uh, any sort of athletic golf past high school was. I uh, so I, I think this is also part of part of your feud conversation. It was uh, alleged in the feud by the other party that you had like attempted to go pro in golf at one point. And yeah, didn't make right. it as a I pro. I was a failed. I was a failed uh, yeah. professional golfer. That's correct. So that was yeah. in my mind. I was like, man, I didn't. I had no idea that Nelson was that serious of a golfer. But but that was <laughs> not actually true. That you tried to go pro. You just uh, you, no. you were a serious golfer when yeah. you were. I was pro. so yeah. So I went to Clemson for they had this program. I just wanted to be around golf. So I went specifically for this professional golf management program, which was sort of like a college structured program that fed you into the PGA of America. So typically if you want, typically how it used to work is if you wanted to be a PGA pro, you would do all this like self-study, take some tests and um, then become, you know, go, you have to travel to Florida to take the tests and then they would certify you and you, then you could, become a member of the PGA and, you know, have that status. Um, sometime in like, I don't know when the first program started, but like in the nineties, I think probably. Um, and a lot of them have closed actually now, but hmm. at its peak, maybe 25, 30 colleges around the country had this PGM program, they called it like Florida state, Penn state, UNLV, Clemson, um, where it was sort of like integrated into the college setting. So, um, I mean, I took all full regular college classes, but like one class a semester was like this sort of just like a golf or business related class that cool. um, sort of prepped you for that. And so you sort of just killed two birds with one stone. Um, so right when you graduated, you were able to become a member of the PGA and 
um, just open some opportunities for you if you wanted to stick to that. But that's more of a, that's a single man's um, lifestyle because it's, sure. you know, golf courses aren't getting built all the time. So if you want to progress in that industry, you're just like, you sit in one spot until, a, you know, another, like maybe a step up opens up wherever it is. And then you go take that step up, step up, step up, step up until you make it to, you know, some really good job. And then you just park there for your whole career, essentially. Okay. But it takes cool. a lot of mobility. Um, and I had a family, so it was not going to work very well. So these days, are you are you a full time DFS pro these days? No, mm, no, 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 okay. no, not even close. I'm, okay. I mean, I know that you run cut sweats. Do you like? Is that your full time job? The is cut nope. sweats, or do you have more? No. Okay. Yeah, All yeah. Right, I know. Well. I'm a forensic accounting uh, or a forensic accountant. Uh, my regular job. So. Um, I think I, I, I think do. I do that. Uh, I think maybe, yeah. maybe you post it. Maybe that's your, your Twitter profile or something, or, or you post yeah, it. Yeah, I think you can put it in there or something. It. Yeah. What What does that yeah. mean to be a forensic accountant? Um, so the majority of what I do is related to like natural disaster related stuff. So okay. if you if you own a business, you would carry insurance for coverage if you fall victim to one of these perils, like a tornado or a fire or hurricane or anything like that. Um, and our, our task is to basically try to make you whole from a financial standpoint, had the event not occurred. So I do like a lot of projections in, you know, my day-to-day -day job, um, trying to determine, okay, if this business hadn't gotten wiped out by a tornado, uh, you know, how much money would they have made in the six months that it took to rebuild, uh, you know? What, what are they entitled to from a insurance recovery standpoint? Okay. So we do also, it's fun. The It's interesting because it's um, different stuff. We see, I see a lot of different businesses um, from, you know, uh, the last year I've been inundated with chicken laying um, business. So businesses that are trying to produce as many eggs um, and sell them to customers. Um, we've done casinos restaurants, all, all sorts of, um, hotels, just different things, which is makes it a little bit, it's probably one of the less boring types of accounting that you can get into. Sure. Cool. Um, let, let's work backwards a little bit. Well, actually, first of all, uh, what, what kind of background do you have in statistics and or computer program? And obviously you're, you're doing it as part of your process. You also run cut sweats. Uh, so what is your background like? in statistics computer program do you have like uh, any kind of formal training or just train yourself um i had you know some formal training college classes i was always um i would say generally advanced in math and science not so much in history english so i tended to be more on the math science side so i had a you know and i was always interested in that um sort of stuff so i do have some um formal statistics and math training um, as far as programming is, is concerned, the first time I tried to do any program was probably a decade ago when, um, strokes gained was sort of strokes gained in golf was becoming a thing. Um, and so I had tried to build my own strokes gained sort of like calculator program, um, where you, in, in theory, what it was, was you could just like go through your round of golf and, um, the things that you need to calculate strokes gained are where the ball starts from and where the ball ends. So my thinking was if I could just create this little script where I could just type in T shot 350 yards. Then my next shot was from the fairway, you know, 150 yards. Um, that was my first foray into sort of programming. And then I put it down for a while and then cut sweats. The idea for cut sweats sort of um, came to me in the sense that uh, I had some friends that lived in some places you couldn't play DFS. So for the big tournaments, we would be, they would, you know, they knew I played DFS. So they would be like, Hey, you know, can we, if we give you 50 bucks, can we have like a share of the, and you know, can we just participate in the sweat? And I was like, yeah, sure. So I, you know, I had, um, you know, an Excel spreadsheet at the time that I would, you know, had all our lineups in it and whatnot. And I think it was like pulling in the PJ tour leaderboard 
And so we could see like, oh, here's here's our guy's current scores and here's who we need. And I would send it out to them. They could update it as the um, as the tournament went on. It's just so they, you know, they couldn't obviously, I don't even know back then what you could look at on your on a website as far as a DraftKings contest or a right. FanDuel contest or what. But um, that was sort of the first like idea for cut sweats. And I was like, oh, well, it'd be cool if this was a website. And then um, I think it started at first, it started as a Twitter bot where it just um, tweeted it out every 30 minutes. And it just like was not customized at all. It was just like a couple main contests. And every 30 minutes, we were just like, here's the six out of six rate. You had no idea what yours was, but you were like, huh. you, you know, you could look at your lineups and see, hey, I got a couple or whatever. But um, then it just sort of progressed from there. Like, okay, how about we put it on a website? So, we, so I figured out how to do that. Then I was like, okay, what if I could get the website to take someone's DraftKings name and, you know, get their customized results. Um, so it's just was a, it was a piecemeal process um, that I, I think has actually existed for almost seven years now, which is kind of insane. Cut Sweat says that's how long Cut Sweat has been around. I, th I, th I think it was 2017 when the first tweet was sent. I'd have to go wow. back and look. Um, I think it was like maybe the Valspar, which was a couple weeks ago. It was probably in, I think it was before the Masters, um, but that was just the Twitter version. Um, Account then, created February 2017, so your timeline is correct. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yep. That sound that sounds about right. Um, and so it just you know I built on it. Um, it was free for man. When did I don't even remember? I had to hire some. Like that was like that was like the first line in the sand I got to was like uh, I had no chance of setting it up for. A subscription service yeah. um it just i was like just no and i had got put in touch with someone that was a programmer and we worked out a deal where you know i would pay him x to set it up and he did and um that was how the first sort of subscription um started then you know back you know you never used it back when it was uh it's been different for about three years now i guess um my cousin who um he actually did one of these coding boot camps, like the after after college sort of like it's a thing where you go for some set amount of weeks, six weeks, eight weeks or something. Um, you just go and you just learn every day about programming. And then they it doesn't I don't think it costs you anything up front, actually. Um, but it's then they place you and then you like have to pay them some X percent of your salary. Um, for the first year or something like oh. that or but some time period they, they place no you as in they like they find you a job doing program yes yeah they train you find you a job place you you i don't you know you, i'm sure it's negotiated up front what the percent cut is of the salary and then mm -hmm. i'm sure they're like hey we're going to place you in a job that is in this ballpark of salary we want x percent of it um for some time period um and so he had reached out after he had done that and been doing his programming for a while and just said, Hey, you know, I'm looking for a, a side gig. I know you have this, you know, the cut sweats, just wondering if I could help in any way. And uh, I was to the point where I had really taken it, you know, before chat GPT came along, it was a lot harder to learn uh, mm -hmm. to do different things. And I had just gotten to the point where I, it just taking me way too long to like implement even like small changes. Cause, um, the things that I wanted to do were pretty intricate and it took a while to learn. And so I was like, look, if you want to just build a whole, build the website, because he was going to also use a different programming language. So I was like, you know, take your time, build the website, whatever, if, and if it works for you, it works. And what we'll do is once it goes live, we'll sort of transition into some sort of revenue um, share. And then eventually once, you know, if, if the business grows because of your new website, eventually we'll get to a point where, you know, we're, we're uh, relatively equal owners on the website. So it's worked out for everybody involved, especially the users, because now they get a much better, a much better experience um, when they log into the website. Yeah, it's definitely, it, it's, I mean, it's, is it the only, I guess not, now you have uh, post contest sim several places for a while. It was like the only like uh, sweat kind of, uh website where, where you could like log in yeah. after the fact to see like how you're doing get some some data on how your teams are doing which i guess 
it would be hard to do for anything other than golf because most sports are, you know, it's over a three hour period as opposed to for, for a PGA. It's like you get four days of sweating your, your, uh, yeah, that, that, yeah. I mean, golf is, yeah, the, golf is the easiest one to follow in that sense. And, and, um, everything else, everything else moves so quickly. Um, and, you know, it's one of the things that I struggled with, um, when I, I we do like some live showdown sims now and uh oh you do I'm, i didn't realize that yeah and so i'm not a great um you know i'm not a great programmer but to me the speed is so important like i don't you know and i, I i'm one of the i'm gonna be the biggest critic in what the product is because it's just like i don't really have any interest in knowing how my lineups were doing 15 minutes ago it's right. like serves literally no purpose to yeah. me at all other than like geez i was winning 15 minutes ago and now my lineup suck i run so bad right. um so i'm trying to like strike that balance of make you know making sure that a i think the sims are relatively accurate and b that they are at least relatively timely um golf is nice because you know, you have People don't finish a hole for about 10 minutes. Obviously, you have people all yeah. over the course finishing holes at different times. But, it, you know, once you're in contention and it's near the end of the day, a lot of the people that matter aren't finishing holes very, very quickly. So you have a little bit of time to get the sim out as opposed to NFL showdown or NBA or, you know, MLB is a little slower, obviously. Yeah. Um, but that seems like a gigantic hurdle um, in the sense, like, if you can't deliver it, extremely quickly then you know you're sort of not really doing anything productive right yeah nba in particular i can't even imagine how you do it for for nba with how quickly like nfl you do get breaks between plays so like i guess theoretically, yeah and it just like and uh, golf is just the easy golf to me is the easiest sport to, there's less variables to me uh in golf yeah. but you know thinking about like all the stuff that happen you know can happen in a diff in an NBA game or an NFL game or an, uh, even a Major League Baseball game. I mean, to you know to to accurately sim a Major League Baseball game, you'd have to know you know how long you expect the pitcher to keep going, how short right. of the leash is. You know, there's just so many so many very like what percent chance are you giving the person that just got on first base to steal, and like right. does that change depending on how many outs? That, like it's just I mean, my, and then. And then we haven't even gotten into correlation. Like if you don't get the correlation right in these other sports, it's like the sim is, you know, in all intents and purposes, fairly worthless. Right. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, PGA. I mean, you definitely uh, like staked your claim to the to the right sport for being able to do these things well, and and you know have it be useful for the. I'm, I'm sure you thought of it. That's the reason that you chose PGA for these is because you knew like this is. The one sport where you can make these kinds of sim is going to be useful is that kind of the reason you, yeah you play i think it's just like yeah and it was just it's helpful that i played it a lot and had right. you know a fairly you know i was just like okay what what do i want to see i mean generally the way that something ends up on cup sweats is like okay that's sort of what how i would want to look at it or the best way i think um as someone who plays on a regular basis you know the information that's just useful to me if i'm just trying to figure out how i'm doing um and so we're not you know in uh, our our sims aren't i would never say they're like amazing like very like the most accurate things in the world but all we're trying to do especially in the live showdown sims is identify make sure we're identifying lineups that have a good chance of winning you know i just want to be able to sure. check my you know i don't really check DraftKings hardly at all I just check cut sweats for showdown and i just you know we have a summary if if you're playing showdown um, that just shows each of your contests and it shows, you know, how much win equity you have in those contests. And so I just like, we'll check it throughout the day. I mean, most of the time it's at like zero, <laughs> but you know, which isn't that even that rare, um, you know, uh, but then you'll get the times where it's like, oh, 10% something. And then that's when I will probably check DraftKings. I'll be like, okay, who, like, who do we need? Who's sort of around, um, you know, that, that sort of thing. All right, let me ask you this. I feel like I've, I've heard it asked of you elsewhere, and I think that you've said that it would be difficult to do. 
what what is the the obstacle to doing a projected cut line so so like when you do your six of six rates in the middle of a round six of six rates five of six etc cetera, etc cetera, it's based on that current cut line and i've, I've heard other people right. ask you well, why, why can't you do a projected cut line and i think i've i think you've said that it would be pretty difficult to do that to do a projected cut line yeah i mean it's 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 difficult and i and it's just not um it's not really that useful um okay. in my opinion like okay. uh, it literally is not a single thing that i've ever thought um about doing you know certainly one of the biggest the absolute biggest request if you check the cut sweats mentions is people a telling us that the cut is going to be at a different number and we're mm -hmm. like yes that's this is not a projection it's just a it's a the snapshot in time this is yeah. what is happening right now and so the problem you know we'll get one like one example would be, let's say the cut is minus one and it is 100% going to go to minus two. Okay. Well, the way the cut rules work on the PJ tour currently is the cut is top 65 guys and ties. Okay. So let's say at currently it's minus one and there are 67 guys at minus one or better. Okay. And so we snap that and send it out. And then someone will come back and go, well, the cut's going to be minus two by the end of the day. And if we at that very moment just arbitrarily shifted the cut line to minus two, there might only be like 35 guys at minus two or better. And so now right. we're not even capturing the correct amount of the field. I so that's I the that. that's the problem with just arbitrarily moving the cut line. Um, yeah. What you would need to so we have some functionality that <laughs> I've got to be the worst marketer of all time, but if you are in a DraftKings contest, you can go to Cut Sweats and go to a leaderboard for that contest. Mm -hmm. And we have all the players listed, like a button that says, take me to the cut line. It'll take you right down there. And you can click player scores up or down. So like, and it's only, you know, it's only really useful at the very end of Friday when right. like, you know, the cut is like either going to be this number or this number. And there's a ton of chalk right around that cut, you can like move guys in and out of the cut and the cut will automatically, once you get 65 guys at a number, the cut will shift. Um, but you can change people's scores and then click a button and see what the cut distribution is there. So like, like if, you had a, okay. if you had a mega chalk guy and he was one shot inside the cut line and mm -hmm. he was on his last hole, you could go there and you could click a bogey in for him and it would move him outside the cut line and you could see what that how that changes, how that changes both your lineups and the field's lineups. You can see you, the, the distribution, you, 606 distribution for yourself in the field. Yeah, yeah, it'll give you oh, the, wow. that updated version. And you could click multiple that. guys. You could click a few guys to miss the cut, a few guys to make the cut. Um, it's, you know, it's just, I don't know. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, not the, I'm not the greatest marketer in the world, so I'm not out there being like, you know, come use the website all the time. Just, I, I, I just build it for, you know, people that want to sweat golf. Yeah, it's it's one of your multiple jobs while also being a father. Um, seems like you travel a good amount. I mean, it seems like you're a pretty busy guy. Would you? Yeah, would you I, yeah. Unfortunately, I've been. Yeah, this year has been pretty crazy. I've traveled a lot. Um, some for fun, some for um, you know work, uh, and it's just we we've had just an up and down year. I think you know my two DFNs wins have bookended just. A mostly terrible time for my family in that my mother-in-law died like a few days after um oh that 20k win and then like a week ago i had to put my dog down and I so it's that. just like it, you know has hasn't hasn't been that great other than those couple dfs wins yeah sorry sorry for your losses i no. as somebody who's kind of obsessed with my own dog i definitely like you know get get in my feels every time i see that somebody had to put their dog down more than i did like you know, five or 10 years ago, like there, there's a difference uh, for me, at least like between like your, for me, uh, your, your family pet growing up, like I never had, I, I bonded. I thought I had a good bond with my family pets. Nothing like having your own dog. It's a, uh, it's a different feeling. Uh, so. Yeah, that that's, that's totally true. I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad I had the foresight a few years ago um, to get another dog. And I, you know, and I specifically told my wife, I was like, look, I think we should get another dog. And only because it's so it seems to me like it would be much much easier to go from two to one than I've from one thought. to zero yeah like uh i just 
I would feel so awkward walking into my house without a dog. Yeah. Be, yeah. Be nuts. I have definitely had that thought. I, for me, I'm not sure if my dog would get along with another dog is, is the biggest thing. It's like, I don't want to get a dog if he's not going to like this yeah. new dog. Like I don't want to make right. his life worse. So it's, uh, I think it's, it also uh, is beneficial. I think to the dog, you know, it beneficial to the old, you know, the older dog, you know, rather than sit around all day, he had, right. You know, sometimes he couldn't keep up with the younger dog who wanted to play a little bit much, but you know, keeps them occupied. I, you know, I think it's generally a good thing. I also, um, I realize now that I, I talked about how sad it is that you lost your dog when you also lost your mother-in-law. Obviously, that is uh, generally going to be sadder for, for most of us. I haven't lost, lost my mother-in-law, so I haven't had to yeah. talk about that. But I was, yeah, I mean, so yeah, it's, really it's, you know, it's certainly much worse year for my wife than it is um, for me. Yeah. So um, yeah, but that's tough. All good. All right. Um, well, we will, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about more fun, more fun topics, I guess. Yeah. Um, so you, uh, you go, going back to, you said that you were a poker player, but take, take me back to like post-college. Like what, what have you been up to like professionally? Um, like to <laughs> yeah. take me through your professional career arc. Okay. Um, maybe not that far a topic. I don't know. Yeah. We'll I, I played out. poker for a couple of years. Um, and then they, you know, I, how familiar you are, but they, you know, they shut it down. Um, mm -hmm. I, it was actually tax day. We were coming up on, it was 2011. God, 13 years. That's insane. Um, I was in Vegas. I remember when it happened, I was at a wedding and I had just seen like Phil Ivy had just walked past me. I was in like, uh, the Venetian or something. And he was, and I just texted my buddies. I was like, Hey, Phil's playing craps in the Venetian. And, uh, one of them texted back. They were like, Hey, have you seen the legal stuff? And I thought they were, you know, there was some stuff about online poker getting legalized in some different States. Mm -hmm. I thought that's what they were talking about. I had no idea. And um, so I was like, no, I don't know. And they said, uh, well, you know, the government just sees those, the, the main three websites. And uh, so like when you went to log in, you just got a Department of Justice emblem. And then, uh, so I was like, okay, well, I'll just get my money and, you know, go do something else. So I um, used my golf background. I got a job at a golf course um, that um, I just did for like a year or so. And then I had a friend that was working at a trading company. And so I did that for about a year. And I think it was like not the most straightforward trading company in the world. Um, it was a little, it was a little shop. It wasn't like, I've heard some horror stories about these, some of these shops, like making you put up your own capital. It wasn't, it wasn't quite that shady. Um, they, they provided us capital. Um, but I'm not sure the, people that were running the ship knew exactly what was going on. Um, you said, you said so, a trading company? Yeah, like a uh, day trading. Um, okay. Yeah. Huh. Like uh, it started you out relatively small. Um, but, you know, at, at some point, I you know, I could get, you know, $50,000 positions on, um, wow. which I thought was kind of crazy. Um, so and, and so I was doing that and you know, there was just some things that I saw while doing that, that made it seem like, you know, okay, people, people doing stock trading might not be around, um, for a very long, you know, for much longer, just cause you could tell like the algos and the computers were sort of mm -hmm. really getting into it, yep. you know, and you're like, okay, okay. Me Clemson graduate, some math background, not very much versus like an army of just quants that are gonna just okay not a career path really mm -hmm. so i got out of that um i got a another golf job right around down the street from me like just kind of pure luck um which was nice i like 10 minutes from my house which is like just very random the house that i bought uh i think i i closed on this house i've same house that i'm in now i closed on the house like two weeks before poker got shut down so that was a that was a fun time because I was yeah. always like, you know, people. I'm sure people think I'm a nit, which is rightfully so. Yeah. And uh, I was always concerned. Um, I would always tell my wife, I was like, I'm not super comfortable buying a house. Like, what if my what if poker just like goes away? And Gosh, she's yeah. always like, No, we should just buy a house. We'll just buy a house, buy a house, buy a house. And finally, I just was like, Fine, just buy it. Like, really was, you know, we, we we got in at a great time, you know, right after the recession, obviously. Um, but then like 
literally two weeks later all you know and i kept a lot of money on the sites because it was easier to get money off the sites than it was to get it on um hmm. so i got this golf job i worked there for a, a little bit and then um this finally this guy you know i got to know a bunch of the members there and one of them finally came up to me and was like we got to get you out of here get you a better job and i was like okay you got something for me to do um you know and he's like i think i do I, I got this guy i'm going to talk to and uh the next day i heard from this other guy that he had talked to and was like hey why don't you come down to my office for lunch um and it was the guy that founded the company that i currently work for wow and so uh, we went to lunch i went to lunch with a bunch of the guys that worked in the office i was telling them you know i was very well by that time i had already been playing dfs um a little bit and so i would and, and that's how i built sort of my excel i would excel repertoire which was useful in the job that i do on a day-to-day -day basis mm -hmm. um and so they were sort of slow at the time when i had lunch so they were like we just got to wait sort of for a hurricane or something we'll get busy and uh it was about a year after i had sat down with them for the first time that um i think someone left the company and then they got busy and they needed some help and so i I've, I've been doing that for um eight years now so wow it's 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 been a while so you so you already had like you were it didn't take you much prep like training to, to be ready to do forensic accounting because you already had some background yeah. okay yeah i mean it it, cool. it you know it made it made um you know pretty good sense to me um so yeah it was it was a, it was a fairly easy transition um into you know okay how to how to project sales and you know uh different different things that are necessary in the job right is the the golf course still there like two blocks down the road yeah yeah it's still there yeah it's a nice it's a nice golf course and are, um, are you able to golf now like or is your wrist still like messed up no i can play yeah i'm i'm okay. good to, I, i'm good to play now i've been playing um I don't, I don't, I don't get to play a ton. Most of my golf occurs in my garage, which I have a little simulator out there. Um, so probably half of my technical golf, uh, occurs out there. I play like once or twice a month at most during golf season. So I'll play like 15 to 20 times a year, I would say. Um, so that's, what, what, know, what is that's, golf season for you? Like, uh, you know, like here that. you can play, I mean, here you can play year round if the yeah. weather is decent. They, they, it's not like they don't close. So it's I, just, guess I was it, wondering if like does it get too hot to play golf where you where you are? Like, that's how I love the heat. Here in Minnesota. So yeah. I, you know, I, I don't. The heat will never ever bother me. So that I don't. I grew up in Virginia. There's no chance I could live anywhere north of that. Yeah. Um, okay. So I, I just I love the heat. Unless I have a snowboard strapped to my feet, I'm not too interested in the snow. Okay. All right, so it doesn't get too hot. So, so you can play year round, but you typically play. Oh, it gets. Oh, it gets. It gets hot and probably too hot for some people. But um, I'd rather be. I'd rather be out there in a hundred degrees and insane humidity than freezing my butt off. I think I would too. I, I'm. I'm. Despite living in Minnesota, I'm not a huge cold weather guy. I don't love the cold weather. Um, although, the the older I get, the fatter I get, the more I like don't love hundred degrees. Like when I was, you know, a skinny high school kid. I like love 100 degrees. Like that's perfect. Yeah, the hotter the better. Now, now it's like it can be a little bit too hot for me at times. Um, yeah, in, in general, yeah. I, I mean, I'm... like if you go to if you go to the Braves Stadium, depending on you know if you go in the summer, depending on which side of the stadium you sit on, you're just getting belted by the sun. You know, sometimes yeah. that can get a little bit much. Um. So you you played poker. Any other like uh, pro hobbies that were that are kind of related to DFS? Are you a chess guy? Anything like that? I played chess. I did play chess um, growing up. Um, so I, I've, I've always been, um, games are always fun. Okay. So I like me and my wife have, a. we haven't played, we've switched games. There's been a couple of new games that have come in, um, uh, that we've started playing, um, more frequently and some with the kids, which are a little bit easier, but, um, we, for the longest time have had, have you ever played, um, open face Chinese poker? By no. chance. Have so, um, it's a fairly simple game you get we play i think the pineapple version of it but um you start with five cards and 
you can lay those five cards down however you want. Um, but your goal is to make um, two three card hands. So let's we're going to start at the top. You make a three card hand at the top, mm -hmm. a three card hand at, in the middle, and a five card hand. No, sorry, three card hand at the top, five card hand in the middle, five card hand in the bottom, and your hands have to progress. So like the top hand has to be your worst hand. Then the second hand has to be your next best hand and your third hand has to be your best hand. And so like, if you get out of order, you lose. Um, but we, so the scoring in that game can get a little interesting, but generally if you win all the hands, you get six points. And if you win two of the hands, you get one point. And we had um, like a Google sheet where we were keeping track of that for probably like, 2000 games and so like whenever we were around we would just be you know had nothing to do or we're traveling yeah. we're like let's bust out the cards and you know play a few um hands of that was chinese fun. poker so it's yeah, there's some strategy to the game which makes it yeah which makes it fun yeah I, I only like games where there is at least some strategy involved i don't like it to be all of it. it sounds like a pretty like there would be a lot of strategy involved there yeah um, yeah so you're just trying to you know um trying to figure out you know you, don't, you obviously don't want to make too good of a hand um, before you know what you're going to get in the bottom. So, you know, there, you know, and you see what cards are out, you know, if you, if you need a card that's out, obviously you got to sort of adjust your strategy. So it's fun in that sense. Cool. Um, it sounds like you've been playing DFS for a very long time. What, when did, do you know approximately what year you started playing DFS and also, uh, what drew you into DFS? Yeah. So, uh, man, I mean, I probably dabbled as early as it started. Um, like draft day do you guys if you remember um i don't know how, don't how long how long were day. you in when did you start dfs 2011 is my first entry according oh, to okay so you, you know you were back in the draft day streets i were i did um some i did i don't i don't know i did um some poker training for a website called card runners uh okay which those guys some of those guys own etr now or your oh yeah Tom it's like Kay, T taylor Andrew wiggins and taylor Kay, okay yeah. yeah yeah so i at the tail end of the poker boom i did do a couple um instructional videos uh for their website and i got to know their business i think he was like their business developer guy he now he now works in golf analytics which is pretty cool um and we got to know each other and then i knew that they had sort of once sort of poker died they had pivoted into DFS. And so that was, I probably played on that website draft day before I played on um, anything else. And so I, you know, I just dabbled. Um, poker stars, I think had, um, I swear poker stars had a DFS site, if I recall correctly. I don't remember that. I mean, I, I would, I don't ever played on poker. So I played there on was, the, there was one, there was one DFS site very early on. It was called, I feel like it was called stars something, not star street. I know star street. But there was one that you could play on and it had projected winnings like it was like, um, like yahoo does yeah but these were like yeah but it was like 2012. i mean it was kind of it yeah, was yeah. kind of insane That's um cool. um so i like playing on that one and i think i feel like it was related to poker i feel like it was because then they like pulled out of the us or i don't i don't i can't remember what it was or it just went away maybe i forget so someone will know maybe what it was but I just sort of dabbled. Um, again, probably f played a little bit more golf DFS on draft day. Um, did not have much success at all. That was before I had like known about doing any models or anything like that. Right. Um, I think I had done some stuff in Excel, but it, it was it was not great. Um, when I first took it seriously, and seriously meaning like putting in any time at all was probably like 2015 um me and a buddy of mine we you know we've always liked baseball and we FanDuel used to have these 100 man contests that you could play and it was like three entry max and so we would I would just spend the day like registering for you know it was like back in the poker days when a uh, sit and go would fill up then a new contest would like be generated. Right, right. And so that's what happened like throughout the day for these things like, oh, a new $5 contest got filled or what, once it got to some threshold, then they opened up a new one. So you would just be like clicking all day, like, oh, new contest, like, let me get in. I would, we would just like pepper 
they had like one dollar contests, five dollar contests, ten dollar contests. All these. Were, were you able to reserve? Or did you have to like make your lineups as you entered? Um, no, you could. You could reserve. You could. Um, I don't think. Uh, do they have CS3 upload at that? There's no way. I don't recall. I doubt it. Yeah. I don't. I mean, maybe they, could, they must have because people people were playing like 500 lineups at a time back then. Yeah, right? like, that's, that's like, probably true. Were like, yeah. But yeah, so we would just we would just register for as many as we could. You know, you, like you know, you're playing one dollar contest, five dollar contests. We didn't even play the ten dollar contest probably till later in the season. So you know, you're talking about having like fifty bucks or a hundred, you know, less than a hundred dollars for sure. In play. And what, were you so you you said it was three entry maxes in a hundred man contest? Were you playing the same three entries over and over and over, or were you like doing different? lineups for each different i was or... doing different i was doing i was always doing different lineups okay. uh my buddy was notorious for like just slamming jam he would slam like trains and all sorts of stuff um hmm. and so i would make we had like a a joint excel uh adventure where i mean it was just you know we were trying to some of the tabs were trying to like pull in data from roto grinders like to get the lineups and you know, all the like stuff from fan graphs to get uh, updated, you know, um, uh, I, my buddy was always like, really into the stats. And he was like, trying to, you know, do his own projections, just like, you know, straight from the, like the no ball. Yeah, absolute, like, I know this, uh, and no one's going to tell me anything else. And I was always like, okay, how can I shortcut this and make it as simple as like, let's get some Vegas lines in here. Yeah. and uh try and, and make that a lot you know simpler um and that that was probably the first time i ever did um well I, for the first season or two it wasn't that it was it wasn't that advanced but we knew about stacking so that was a okay. huge so ad, more advanced than most yeah and so we would just like slam the best stacks uh all the time and I probably still have, I mean, let me see if I can find this. I probably have the, like a tracking sheet maybe for it. Um, yeah, you should, you should see if you can find that. Okay. Let me were, see. Were, I, you, uh, were you crushing it? I mean, you, uh, you yeah, I, mean, I think we had like, like a, I have 16% ROI or something like that for the whole yeah, season, we'll which, which was, I yeah. think, pretty, pretty good. Um, let me see here. I've got like a OneDrive folder that's called MLB. Uh, DFS, <laughs> of course. Of course uh, let me see. Oh man, um, I'll, I'll I'll look at it. So you know, so we started there, and then, yeah, like I have a, I have a, I I have some hilariously named uh, Excel sheets. I'm looking at here: analysis Vegas totals versus DK points. That was last edited. Well, put on this share site and early 2019 um mlb showdown analyzer with breakdown i mean there are just some incredible uh um uh, park and team analysis i mean <laughs> the, just looking at the names of these files is just really an all-timer i mean um, you were probably way more advanced than anybody else playing at the time though like you look at it now and you laugh at yourself but like this is probably more advanced than anybody else was at the time or most people were at the time yeah, yeah. I mean, th yeah, there would be right no no way to know. Um, you know, I, but I was just you know piggybacking off anything that I could find on social media or anything that anyone else wrote. I was just like, okay, you know, this this seems to this seems to make sense. Um, yeah. And and let me let me try and copy what this guy is doing, um, and and see if you know I can um you know make my way that way and so at some point at some point then that was when i got um probably the first sort of like simulation i ever did was i went back and i got like uh it's it's all and this is like one of the obstacles for just modeling in general is getting enough good data like it's hard it's like it's like impossible to go back like and go back and find someone that's publishing historical data. No one ever keeps it. It just, just goes away. Um, and so there was this website, I think it was called DFS Nerd. Does that sound familiar to anybody? 
Um, it sounds vaguely familiar to me. I don't know that I ever used it. Okay. I used it because they, I think you could go back and see historical stuff. Mm -hmm. And the first, like, sort of, probably the first ever simulation I ever did was I went back and I got a ton of history on, and I, and I got everybody's projected score for the night and then their actual score for the night. And then, and I had it for like every game for one season. And so then I was like, okay, if someone, there it is. <laughs> if, if, so then I was like, okay, if this person is projected for seven points, let me go and look at the range of outcomes for everyone that was projected for like six and a half to seven and a half points. And mm -hmm. what, like, what did their results look like? Um, and that was, and then I had like this Excel sheet that did all these like, you know, normal, di you know, these distributions that were like, you know, basically simulations. And I was like, and I would see, I would, I was segmenting the players by like outfielders or whatever the positions were on FanDuel. And I would be like, okay, here's like the players based on their projection. Like how often are they going to be the best scorer on the slate or best like outfielder on the right. slate? And, and, um, so I stuck to the hundred mans and then I started like sprinkling in the big GPPs, but I like, I never, ever got close to winning. Um, you know, I was always in like whatever the $4 20 max or something. I mean, it was yeah, a huge yeah. contest at the time. It was like, so I always play, so that was always what I played. Yeah. I mean, but you you got 20 lineups and I don't know, there's like 30,000 people in the contest. Right. So variance is like through the roof. Yeah. Um, so that was, that was sort of my foray. In, and then I, and then I did NFL, um, to some extent, I was really excited when NFL showdown first came out. Um, and I think I had a pretty good process, but I got obliterated. Um, I had like a bunch of really close calls and just never really got across the finish line. Um, and then at that point, you know, now we're probably into 20, 17, 2018, 2019 timeframe. But NFL Showdown probably started in 2019 or something like sounds that. About, sounds about right. Um, damn, I wish I could find this old um, MLB. I know I have like a 2016 results thing. Um, and so then NFL Showdown came out. I think I got like, I got excited. I got demolished. Um, and then since then, it was mostly golf. Um, probably starting in 2018, I think, um, and 2019, they probably, all these new formats were starting like NFL showdown started golf showdown, started MLB showdown started. They all started like probably the same year if I had to guess. Um, so I'm, so I'm looking at, at my results just in Roto tracker just to see. So showdown, the first result that I have is January 14th, 2018. Okay. And that is different from showdown captain mode, which my first result is October 1st, 2018. So maybe they started with showdown without any kind of captain. And then the following NFL season, they introduced showdown captain mode in, in October of 2018. And it's possible I just didn't play too. That's, I mean, who knows? <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, I, well, yeah, that, that sounds right to me. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm just searching my email. I found this email I sent to somebody that nice. was like a chart of my MOB results so far. Nice. And I was up $2,000. It's pretty funny. Oh, uh, yeah. But dang, I was down 1500 at one point uh, back in 2016. It's like, uh, I'm sure these were the 100 fans. Um, trying to just search anything uh, that would that would come up for um, whatever. But so, yeah, so those, you know, all the showdowns came out, I think, probably at the same time. Like, I can't remember which one was first. Probably NFL, I would guess. Yeah. Is that what that was, NFL? That Yeah, that's what I looked up. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and, I, and they probably all came out right about there. And PGA showdown, when it first came out, was literally a joke. Um, it's gotten so much harder now, obviously, as, as has every single DFS, DFS sport. Yeah. Um, 
but the mistakes, the, the, the amount of influence the previous round had on who people would roster was like unbelievable. It was like, you would get guy like nowadays, if you go, you're going to click, if you're going to go see the mass, like round one showdown PGA tomorrow, like, I don't know who's going to, well, it's a smaller field. So it's kind of skewed, but the highest owned guy is probably going to be 30%. Okay. Maybe, maybe, maybe less. And it's a, and it's a small field. Um, back when it first started, you would get, uh, no joke. The, some of the highest owned guys would be on half the rosters. It was like not even a thing. And it would, and, it, and, yeah. and if it was later in the tournament, if it was like round two, that 40% owned guy would have been like, Five percent owned in round one. I mean, it was the swings were ginormous, and it, um, it was just people would you know assume that if somebody did well the previous day, they were going to do well again, kind of thing. Yeah, that was it. It was that was all they were doing, and like I had a, I think I played. Um, this was before you know data golf has obviously changed the mm-hmm. whole realm um, of of golf. I would say um, since they. When they they used to just do daily roto stuff, um, and even you know even then they had a lot of influence. But I'm talking about before even that. Um, I think like I had like a thirty percent ROI in D- PGA double ups, and it was just like straight up. Do you, do you still play PGA double ups? No, okay. no, no. I don't. I don't think. I mean. You're probably, it's probably prof. It's probably like barely profitable. Okay. Um, if you're good, obviously, al- almost, almost not profitable. Like, yeah. I, to, like masters. If you're playing like anything under a hundred dollar double up, um, you were probably, um, you could probably beat masters hundred double ups and lower, like pretty handily this week. I would guess. Just because there's going to be a lot of people in there that um, aren't aren't doing things that they should be doing, okay. um, but on a like last week, you know, like you get these um, obscure tournaments where there's not a lot of public interest in them. I mean, I I would I would bet that double ups over twenty dollars. No one's no one's beating the rake. Hmm. Yeah. So okay. yeah. So, um, but yeah. So yeah. Cali is saying DG released DFS projections. I don't know. Is he saying, Callie, are you saying on their website or is that Daily Roto? Because that, mean- that, that was a big, um, you know, not everyone subbed to Daily Roto, but then once they went mainstream with their own service, um, that really changed a lot of things. I don't think I've ever, like, used Daily Roto. Maybe maybe I'm misremembering. Well, Daily Roto doesn't exist anymore. It's Oh, okay, okay. But it was, I- it was, I would, I don't know what it was, you know, Dink and Leone's. Um, oh, that was their site. website before ETR? Yes. Okay, well, they were like Druby um, worked there. I mean, they had a great product. I mean, they had a great product and they had a, a literally a really amazing team yeah. um, of just Sounds like strong. guys that were either crushing or are now crushing. Um, it was, you know, it was definitely a, you know, I think they were more well known for ML, MLB and NBA for sure because Dink was there. Yeah, um, which I, I've I think it's funny. I've I think of Leone as being an NFL guy, but I, maybe they all played everything back back then. Yeah, I don't. I mean, Leone. I'm trying to think, you know, what his specialty more of an NFL back then. I don't. I don't even know. I don't know if he. I mean, I guess he played uh, baseball or or NBA. I I, I literally just NBA. listened to a show. He he was on. Um, the swole cast like today or yesterday and they talked about a little bit and then talked about he, he and, and dink buyer um and how they i think they both used to play everything was kind of what they were saying uh but i my, my impression now is that dink is like mostly just nba but i guess he, he won some nfl like best ball contest so he definitely plays nfl too but i, I definitely like i categorize them as like dink nba leone nfl and i'm sure they, they both play everything probably yeah, I've seen Dink a little bit in the PGA streaks recently. Uh, oh, really? Uh, a fun throwback. One of them, I think it was Leone. Uh, one of them had a big score at the Masters, if I recall correctly, and it was because uh, it was the year. I think he locked Sergio. 
when Sergio won. Leone did. Wow. And and he got uh, a Kucher hole in one on the same lineup. I can't. Uh, I think that's it. Um, yeah. But it was yeah. Cali saying yeah. They 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 work together. Daily Roto and Data Golf was doing Data Golf's run by you know two smart brothers. Um, do, do you know who they are? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Is it the yeah, Chipotle I've Bros? To, what was that? No, not the, not the Chipotle Bros. Mm-hmm. Um, but there are two guys that two brothers that were um, into golf modeling. And they got their start doing Daily Roto. Then they, then they started their own website, and then eventually uh, broke off and and did their own thing. I've only ever used Data Golf for the cut line profitability. Like, just I, I check it for what is the the cut line looking at, and, and you can you can track the golfers on that. Um, but I, I I've learned. I think Callie was telling me that like for pick six. So I've gotten into PGA pick six, which I. Even even despite not really knowing golf, it's fun because you can just like look at like okay, here are the odds of, you know, making the cut and then do under or over thirty six and a half holes. Like it's, it's very straightforward, so it makes yeah. it fun to. It's a very simple sweat for those of us who don't really know PGA uh, very well. Oh, Callie, Callie, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, I take back everything that I have just said. We will we will move on from this conversation. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I haven't. Um, I've played like. I played like one slate of pick six is kind of annoying in the sense. Well, DraftKings really does not want you to get the picks, <laughs> as far as I can tell. Like they don't, uh, you know, they don't make it easy to uh, get it, and so you have to like. I mean, yeah. I assume you're like looking at the screen and then like comparing data golf. Like I make a whole spreadsheet of like here are the golfers in in the manual uh, over under thirty. So, yeah, manually I make a spreadsheet yeah, yeah. and then go through and yeah, look at the that, odds. Like, yeah, I think I started that one time. I got to like ten names, and I was like, "Dude, there's no freaking way." I'm it took a long time. Yeah. It takes a while. <laughs> and so, uh, I I think you know they are make they make it tough to get. I'm just gonna read this test kit for a second, but uh, I haven't done it. I have. I would be interested to run. Um, I want. I they don't. Cali sent me a pick six uh, CSV one time, and I optimistically thought that it would be in a decent structure that I could like. Uh, I wanted to sim. I wanted to just see, like, like yeah. I have round sims that I could apply because um, yeah. I have some code that does underdog and prize picks and whatnot. Um, so I, I would be interested to see. Um, yeah, I think, Sorry, I, I, think did, so did I think and I think Kucher had an ace that year. Someone can go back and look, but I'm pretty sure Kuch did. Um, and I think and the amazing thing is Leone locked Sergio. I mean, imagine yeah. locking. The guy that the won guts, the, golf the guts involved there, yeah, it's yeah. impressive. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so pick, um, you know, pick six. It just it's it's just too much work. But I would love to I would love to sim it because I know the rake is high. So I'm just interested mm-hmm. in like, is it even beatable? I mean, twenty percent rake is like pretty egregious. Uh, yeah, I'm Kelly Kelly curious. getting mad at me, and then um, he's reminding me he quit playing uh, pick six because of the rake getting too high. So twenty three percent. Like to me, like just I would. Like gun to my head, I would think you, you cannot be twenty three percent rank. Um, the other the, and the other thing is, you know, DraftKings is obviously extremely incentivized to, you know, I don't know how much effort they're putting into the picks now. It doesn't look like much. As I think as I, I think the, the pick six product. I uh, so I, I met with a guy from DraftKings. Uh, and, it, and it was like kind of like his baby, and it sounded like they they are putting a lot of thought into pick six. Well, it, it's they, not, it's not right. Like... I think I think one thing I've harped on for a while um, that I don't think um, a lot of people take into account is like there's actually a fairly adversarial. You know, everyone is just like, oh, it's peer to peer, doesn't matter. Like, right? The DraftKings doesn't care. Well, that, that, you know, it's probably true in. Uh, yeah, Kush on 16 made a whole one. Um, it's probably true when back in the day when everything was going up. Like it was just like, you know, every contests are increasing, every, you know, everyone's getting rich, everyone's depositing, prize pools are increasing, there's more people coming into the game. But once that has slowed down, and it's probably in reverse now, I would guess. Yes, you know, probably. the economy is shrinking. You know, us and DraftKings are are competing quite heavily for money um you know they're in an ideal world you know if people win too quickly and this happens on poker sites or it used to happen on poker sites it's like they would get rid of the heads up tables because people were fleecing the fish too quickly 
And so the site's not getting any, especially the rake was lower on heads up tables. So the site is not getting any benefit from you fleecing the fish. Um, the same thing happens in both pick six and DFS. So, you know, DraftKings ultimate, you know, goal in, you know, it, to make, you know, their dream scenario is they create this DFS product that people want to play, but that no one really has an edge in. And so right. no one is like vacuuming money out of the economy. Everyone is just playing, they're generating rake and DraftKings is, you know, the games go on forever and DraftKings just continues to, um, you know, generate rake. Obviously for them, the growing economy is much better because as prize pools get bigger, they get a, you know, they get more rake. But if yeah. in a non-growing DFS economy, the relationship is very, is I would say quite adversarial and they are heavily incentivized to price DFS players as good as possible because, and this, and this, I can't believe, you know, the better the pricing is, the lower the, the edges, you know, I think, right. you know, that to me, it's quite simple to understand, you know, if you're playing a versus a bunch of idiots, your edge is going to be gigantic. Yeah. Um, you know, if you have a huge projection edge, you're going to have a very big edge in a DFS contest. Yeah. But if DraftKings prices everybody very well, and you, and then all you have to do is spend the full salary cap to make a decent team, right? Then the Where edge is, the is diminished significantly. Yeah. Now you're down to game theory, roster construction, right. correlation. Um, and that edge is infinitely smaller than the projection edge. Like if you, yep. you know, the, I mean, I'm sure anyone can check their rotor tracker. I'm sure back in the day at people, I don't you know, not a lot of people track this. I have tracked it for a while for, just for golf specifically, but I have, you know, probably thousands and thousands of contests of PGA DFS, where I can look at, okay, how, what was the average score of lineups throughout the field? Like, okay, what was the, what was the average score and, or what was the average projection and how different was the best projected team and the worst projected team? And that gap has only narrowed significantly really? um, in PGA DFS. Like, I don't like last year, um, I would say in, since I started tracking like every showdown contest, which started in maybe September of 22, my average lineup scores like less than a quarter of a percent more than the field average. You know, I'm, I'm not like murdering people. I'm not like, oh, I'm the best at picking golfers. You guys suck at it. Um, right. Uh, it's just everyone's good at picking golfers. I And, right. you know, and then there's no correlation. So you don't have some of the other aspects that you might have in um, some other games, yeah. Um, like tennis would be similar to golf, not, not much correlation UFC sort of, you know, the, the fires are negatively correlated, but, um, you know, there's bigger edges in the games where those correlation factors play a role because just another way you can gain an edge on the, yeah. on the field. But, um, and so to go back to the adversarial relationship, the same thing in pick six, you know, they're, yeah. they're, you know, if you if they can price everybody pretty well and so you just go and pick and everyone's 50 50 i mean there's yeah. then there's definitely well, no chance you can be so, so to your point so um in choosing the the over the under 36 and a half holes so basically who is going to make the cut who is not going to make the cut uh and you know I, I spend a lot of time making this spreadsheet like trying to figure out who is likely to make the cut who's likely to miss yeah. the cut um uh when i started doing it i could find golfers that were like greater than 70 percent chance of missing the cut Last week, it was like the best I could find was like 60%. So like they they clearly chose and uh, like, they're, yeah, not, they're so not giving they're, you all yeah. the golfers. It definitely, they tightened up the golfers that they're offering. And I'm not sure, maybe that was a one week thing. I haven't done it yet for tomorrow, but definitely like, yeah, it's not worth my time. If, if nobody's going to be 70% plus to miss the cut or, or make the cut, you know, wh whatever. Um, if nobody's going to have that high of odds, like it's not going to be worth my time to play if like I can't really find any kind of big edge in that sense. So um, right. yeah, definitely, Are you... definitely seems like tightened up a the little only bit. thing i thought of and again i not i probably won't put any energy into it um is have you thought about the are you doing any game theory stuff is what i would ask like are you are, is that not for not for you? pga okay um for for nba i do stuff like 
taking a lot. I take unders whenever possible, just because I, I have been told that most people want to take overs. And I have friends who play pick six. Like they, they ask me all the time, like, you know, what, what are the projections saying? What do you, what do you like for, for this player or whatever? And they want to take the overs specifically. Like, like I have friends who play picks just from the Timberwolves games. Cause they're, they're going to watch Timberwolves game. Yeah. They want to play. Right. They want the overs generally. Um, yeah. Of course my, my friends have shortened up because we, we've had these conversations, but I think a lot of people just like, I'm going to be watching this game. I want to take overs on my favorite players and cheer for them. Um, so I do think that there is game theory edge just in just in taking un- unders for the most part. Um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's I, an interesting. I, I, yeah. I thought of just like if I was going to do it, I would I would um, put in s- just something related to just like the popularity of a player is what I like. You know, I would yeah. try and pick like good edge picks where the player is like obscure, like you know, uh, like some random golfer. Um, and you know, people are going to, you know, go to Scotty and, and then you just like pray that the Scotty thing busts. Um, but it seems to me like, like, like there, like so many things are mispriced that if, if Scotty is mispriced and, um, who's an obscure Denny McCarthy is mispriced and they have like, and you think like the edge on the pick is the exact same. You certainly would just rather pick the Denny McCarthy pick, right? Um, for sure. So that you know, the only thing I've ever thought about. I mean, I have some ideas, but then DraftKings made it so freaking hard to like get them in a usable format. Um, where I would, I would just like, if you have DFS ownership, I'm sure you could just, um, you know, use that as sort of like the tiebreaker. Which yeah, is kind of an interesting theory. Yeah, that, that is, a, and I think most, I think a lot of people don't even think about like the ownership aspect of pick six of like, you you are because it is peer to peer like there that is a big part of the edge is like you're gonna win more when your picks it and other people's don't I think a lot of people don't really think about that um, it, it's it's an interesting concept it, it's it's funny for like NBA because they they can't change the lines you know that the lines are if if there's an injury and as Callie said they do try to like. If, if somebody's questionable, like they factor that in ahead of time, like they just don't give you those options. Uh, but if yeah. they, like if there's a surprise injury, like sometimes you will have a huge projection edge on like a player who is, you know, the, the line is way too low because now his teammate is out for, for NBA in particular. Like his teammate is out now, he projects way better. And then it's it's an interesting game theory of like, well, now he's like he's 90% to hit the over on whatever the, the line is they have for him. I've never seen it that high, but um, yeah. I don't know. There are, it is interesting because it's like, yeah, I mean, well, now you find a huge edge like, there, think, but also a lot of people are going to play it. So, yeah. And, and probably they're like those sort of situations, um, you know, might, you know, re, you know, if, if everyone gets a free square, then does that would reduce the payouts, right? Mm-hmm. Technically. Yeah. Like it's every, like ev- everyone hits, then yeah, it, everyone has so, that um, same pick. Although it is, they have started doing the, so in, uh, to, to, uh, to counter the, the 23% rake, they have started doing this thing where they, if the payout is too low, like if it's lower than their low estimate, they will give you a bonus in the the difference mm-hmm. there, like to, to make up the difference you. in their low estimate. So um, that, that's kind of another wrinkle of like, well, maybe you do just like if there are if there are ninety plus percent to hit, maybe you do just jam those kind of plays. I don't know. It, it's an interesting it's an interesting yeah, game. It is. I've I've had a lot of success. Like I've made some good money on pick six, um, but I don't know if that's just I've run hot. I don't play a ton, like low volume. So like I right. probably just run run hot in my lim- limited play. Do you do uh, underdog and prize fix um, as much? Not as much. Um, yeah, n- uh, honestly, not really much for, for the for that product. I, I obviously play a ton of underdog, like best ball. I play underdog dailies, all that kind of stuff, but I don't do the pick them stuff None of the as picks. much. Okay. I, I thought like golf actually was, I started doing that um, maybe in the fall, I guess. Um, and I enjoyed it a lot. You know, maybe because it seemed like the edge was fairly large. Um, mm-hmm. at, in golf, you're actually, t- they don't seem to be that far off on uh, valuing the skill of golfers. Um, all of the alpha in underdog golf comes from if you think that the, the way the course is going to play is significantly different than the way underdog is projecting it. Um, so, like, I can look at, I can run the underdog pickums and see like what underdogs implied scoring effectively is so like i i can run it and i and whatever you know based on the over unders for birdies based on the over under for score i can i can sort of imply hey okay underdog thinks the course is going to play one under par 
tomorrow. And then if I look and I see the weather and it's like, I don't think it's going to play one under par, then yeah. you got a, you know, a fairly large edge. Um, the thing that's incredibly frustrating to me about underdog, and I don't know if this is the same on price picks. I haven't done as much on price picks is that, you know, they advertise obviously the three picks is a six X five picks a 20 X when you go in there and they adjust the payout on the fly. Um, people have to be really careful about it because it looks like it's not that big of an issue. Like it's not that big of a change. Like I had one the other uh, few weeks ago, and this is when I finally sort of gave up until I can, what I need to do is when it, when my code sends me the picks or tells me what the combos I should bet are, I'm going to get it to tell me this combo is good down to X multiplier because I had one I, where I thought underdog had the course like, significantly wrong mm -hmm. i thought the course would play like either much easier or much harder and so you know i was you're slamming correlated bets because you know it's like they don't let you bet the same prop but over bogeys under birdies over score those are all and they consider that a correlated bet on on yeah. i didn't realize that they would consider yeah. that a correlated bet for right. different golfers so, uh, or is it for the same golf. golfer? no 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 you can't they won't let you put they won't let you put the same golfer yeah, so so they're categories. considered correlated, just like they're correlating based on like. Play, yeah, and they are. If the course plays golf. harder, then yeah, yeah. yeah all I mean, those clearly, but, are, but I wouldn't. Yeah, I mean, they, they, they are. They sort of are on the ball. Like, let's yeah, call uh, it for more so it than I thought, to be honest. Yeah, right. And so, my code spits it out. You know, they're they're way off. I think that you know, let's let even just imagine that this edge is true. My thing says it's a hundred percent ROI. The bet is a hundred percent mm -hmm. ROI. Okay, I click it in, and my program is obviously assuming three picks, six X payout. Okay, I click it in, they reduce it to 4.7 payout. And I was like, ah, that's probably good. But I, I did, I took a pause and I actually just like didn't place any wagers that day. And I was just like, ah, I'll, I'll look at this another time and just see what it is. And when I went back and I did the math, that 100% bet at six X payout actually turned negative at 4.7 payout. So, and, you know, and, and, and hundred percent is an yeah. insane edge. Right. So like, you know, if you're, if you're like odd, you know, line shopping, you know, what is the odds minus 119 is, you know, if you beat that on a three pick, you're, you know, so if you just like, Ooh, pepper in, I saw this on the book, it was minus 140. This one's minus 140. This one's minus 140. I don't know off the top of my head, how big of an edge that would be it's probably not that big. But you, then, then you're going from not a big edge to hugely negative edge if you take that cut in the payout. So it's just something like it's probably something that people aren't as aware about as yeah. they, you know, maybe should be. Um, but it just it gives me a it leaves a really bad taste in my mouth and like the landscaping, the landscape of the sort of gambling industry. And yeah. that's the sort of way it's going. It's just like very hidden and like, you know, it's like a shell game. It's like, uh, you know, how can we trick you into, you know, thinking that you have an edge when you really don't, um, yeah. and not, and just not being upfront about it, uh, right. which is kind of frustrating. So yeah, I'm off In those way, sites. Now. Yeah. Uh, with pick six. So I guess that is one way that I use, I, it's not really game theory, but like you can use kind of correlation, uh, I don't know if you call it game theory in pick six, where it's like you take overs on Eagles or sorry, overs on bogeys, unders on par or, or on uh, yeah, birdies, yeah, that, that kind yeah. of thing. Like you can, yeah. Then you just hope I, the course the plays either thing. easier yeah, yeah. or harder. I've, I've done that. Yeah. 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 A little bit yeah. In, in PGA. Yeah. Um, that, that's a good way to do it. That, that, and that's what I would do in pick six. I mean, the pick yeah. six doesn't limit you in correlation. So you might as well, you definitely right. should. And I assume the field's sure. not doing it because I mean, yeah, maybe, I mean, I mean it's, I think some, some of the field probably is, but not all of it yeah you should uh, definitely definitely do it in pick six yeah um all right uh so um i i feel we haven't talked that much about golf i guess we've talked about <laughs> yeah we can get into some golf <laughs> well I, I, so, so um and we're already we're already an hour and a half in i we, we didn't really talk beforehand about how much time you can give me here like um yeah because i no, know you are busy. busy you've got the masters tomorrow okay you can yeah, go for a little no, while longer i'm a night um, owl so it's not not a big deal oh, for nice. me at all cool, cool. Um, so talking, talking, just, uh, let's get back to process before we talk golf. Cause I, I do, I do want to ask you just about DF, D, uh, DFS golf or sorry, PGA DFS a little bit, just general. Like I have some, some general, 
questions just because it is uh, my worst sport. I know I, I, I'm, I commiserate uh, with some better DFS players than me who also have uh, straight straight downward PGA D, DFS graph. So so I commiserate those people. But I, I want to talk with you a little bit about it because you definitely have a better handle on it than most of us. But I just want to talk. Uh, so generally, in your DFS process, uh, and I do know that uh, simulations do play a big part for you in your DFS process. Are you just simulating like the results for the golfers? Are you doing contest level? And I think I thought on Lowell's that you had said that you don't do contest level sims. Like you were not capable of doing it at the time that you were uh, on Lowell's, which was that last year, I want to say, maybe early this year even. Is that part of your process doing like contest level sims? Do you do, do your own? Yeah, I do. Do I do now. Like, mm-hmm. Okay. Yep. 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 So I have, yeah, progressed. Um, I would say my old process, I was. I used to be able to sim. I've, I've been able to sim for a while, um, like contest results. Um, if you know, I had, I've always had sims for the golfers, and then I could just apply them to, you know, DraftKings lineups. Um, but the simulating, um, like a pre-contest, is is relatively new for me. And I'm just, um, I don't know, probably eight months. I can't remember when I did Lowell's, but must have been pretty close to when I. Um, actually did made the transition. So prior to that, I would look at some outputs and I would go, okay, this is how you make a good team. And I would, I had my, you know, I use my own optimizer and I would try to hack the optimizer to get me to make lineups that I thought would then show up good, well in the Sims. So I was always using like a SIM <laughs> frame of mind but I was not using um, simulated results like I am uh, currently. Okay. So, so these days you are, and, and you're doing your own, you're not using stochastic saber sim, anything else you're running your own. And is that something yeah. that uh, using chat GPT has allowed you to, to do that? Cause yeah, at the time you were like, I don't know if I'm capable. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, I'm sure it, it helps to have some background for sure. Cause it's yeah. not um, chat GPT is not um, going to be able to create, perfect code. Um, but in general, it gives you quite a good framework for it. It'll get you pretty close. Um, and then you might, you know, a few more prompts or whatever to sort of figure out how to get it to work. But I mean, it's, it really is quite a game changing, um, thing. Do you do your own projections? Mm -hmm. Yep. 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 My whole, my, yeah, my whole golf process is, um, yeah, just 100%. So ownership projections as well. Yes. Yeah. I don't, I actually don't do them for classic um, okay. because there's so many good ones. So no, I don't, I don't do my own um, classic. I might, I might change them based on the contest I'm in um, okay. or the contest I'm using, but I do not uh, do my own for that. Uh, how much does ownership play a role for you in creating your lineups? Yeah. I would, pretty large percent i would say it just, i mean now, now it's just like i'll simulate i'll simulate a contest and i just play the what i think are the best lineups um right for that contest so my i haven't um i have you know actually c- manually clicked in a lineup on sunday when i was on vacation because i wasn't gonna i you know i, I made lineups for the main round four slate um but I wasn't going to play the captain golf slate because I was playing golf and I was in the middle of nowhere. I, I can do stuff from my phone. Like I can kick off the process. Um, but I still have to sort of like remote into my, my computer on my phone and sort of like, then like copy the stuff into the DraftKings CSV and upload it. Sure. Um, so I didn't want to have to handle that on, uh, on a full slate. So I just, I played like just the three, 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 um, captain mode and manually clicked in a lineup for that's probably the first time I've clicked in a lineup or even manually made any adjustment to a team in like 18 months. Okay. Well, I don't, I don't even, I, I look at, I mean, my Q, my quality assurance is like, look at the projections I create, look at the ownership, does it, everything seem, you know, pretty in line? Generate some teams. Look at the teams. Like, do they look 
Does it? Does this make sense? If it makes sense, yeah, I'm just uploading. Nice. Um, unless something like really seems out of whack, then I'll I'll go back in. But I, I'm not like oh, I'll, I'll never like oh, let me rerun it. I want to get more of this guy or or da 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 da. I I don't yeah. I don't do anything like that. You're not doing you're not doing the ball nowhere stuff. You're doing the you're doing the program. You, you're a you're a bot. You're you're like a brick. You you just press buttons. Yeah, that's 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 pretty true. Yeah, I'm jealous. I wish I could be that guy. That's uh, <laughs> I mean, you have to be pretty high level to, to be able to to be a button pusher. Um, that's definitely impressive. Um, yeah, but that to me that's that to me that is for me that is the is the fun is the fun part. It's like can oh, yeah. I build the tool that makes my life as simple as possible? It does it pretty quickly. Does it really well? Um, and you know, saves me a bunch of time. Um, yeah. but, and then I still get to enjoy the sweat. Right. Um, I mean, my favorite time of every single slate is right when the slate locks. Cause then I just go and I look, okay, how was, how were, how did we, how did I do on the projected ownership? What are the SIM results? Yeah. You know, and then I, and then I like, okay, great lineups. And then I watch throughout the day as they bleed. They, get, they only get worse from there. Yeah. But you know, yeah. you played it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, that's, you know, that's. And I we don't I don't do it great at cut sweats for um, when you're dealing with multiple lineups. For one lineup, it's fine. But we try to when we do simulations um, for each lineup, we will post the um, average, the whatever the expected value of the lineup is, and the median value yeah. of the lineup. Um, we, it's it's sort of effed up now because if you've got multiple lineups, you can't just sum all the medians. Doesn't doesn't work that way. Okay. Um, so if you're playing more than one lineup, the med like our median summary for you is not accurate. You'd have to like look at your you have to each simulation, you have to look at your team's lineups and see what the sum result is and then take the median of that. So it had you know it's a more complicated process. But right. it's you know, I think it's fairly loose useful. I think Brick shouted it out one time. Yeah. You know, if you go to our site on a Sunday or a Saturday night and you look at the the main GPP, the twenty dollar GPP, that's two hundred K to first, you know, a lot of times what you'll see is the lineup in first, the E V of that lineup is like uh fifteen K probably. You know, they might have they might have six five to ten percent win equity. Right. So the lineup is worth like twenty thousand. The median the median outcome of that lineup as far as profitability it might be like 750 bucks right and you know so that one you know, one thing that I, we, I would like to get better for us is like giving people a realistic view of what the outcome is expected to be and the median outcome is yeah. much better than the i mean the sim I, like i had a sweat earlier this year um what was it at the arnold palmer i think on maybe Friday or Saturday, um, I had Shane Lowry who was in the last group and I, I was checking my phone. I, I knew I didn't have a sweat really. And because the course was kind of playing hard. So, you know, birdies were not easy to come by and he birdied 16 and 17. Um, he made like two 30 footers back to back. And I hopped up the leaderboard to the point where if he made the last birdie, you get the birdie points. And then obviously you get three in a row streak points oh, so that's yeah. worth five. So you get five points for the streak, five seventy five for the birdie. So it's a ten point seven five points. I was in like eleventh place, but if he birdies and streaks, I jumped to first. And so the sim ran right before he teed off on the eighteenth hole, and the, you know I think about twenty five percent of the guys had birdied the eighteenth hole that day. So I've got a twenty five percent chance of winning fifty yeah. k, and then so my EV was like twelve and a half thousand or fifteen thousand, and but my median was like four hundred dollars because right. if he doesn't make birdie, I don't move up the leaderboard, right? At all, I mean I maybe hop one spot, so it, I go up like a hundred bucks or something. I go from eleventh to tenth place or something. Do, so, does that happen that often in PGA where it's like one hole is going to make that big of a difference? Or is it only when it's like you have the the three birdies are better on the line? I, I guess it kind of would anyway, because you're like if, if somebody's in contention for like the finishing points, I guess it would too. The finishing points matters a lot. I mean, like on Saturday when I had the 50k sweat, um, I sort of thought it was over um like a hole before it actually was over. 
because yeah. um, I thought I thought there was this one guy that was chasing me down, and he had um, a putt on the last hole for bird, like a twelve footer for birdie. And if he made that, we were sort of going to be in a little bit of trouble. And uh, he missed it, and so I was like, "Oh, it's kind of over." But then Henley and Akshay birdied the seventeenth hole, and that was Henley's second birdie in a row. And so now he's coming to a relatively easy hole. It's a par five, you know, generally easier holes. And so now he's got two birdies in a row. So he's going for three in a row. And if he makes birdie, you know, same position I, I was just in, he has yeah. almost 11 points. And um, I needed, I had two guys in the group ahead of him that were playing that same par five. And if my guys parred the hole, we were okay, no matter what happened behind us. And so we're just, you know, Denny McCarthy the very next day hit a very easy shot into the water on that same hole. And so we're just like, I'm just, you know, me and my wife were sitting at the bar. We're just like, these are like routine shots for these guys, but we just need them to make a par. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I would say in golf, in golf, it's pretty rare that you're like, um, you've, you've pulled away. Yeah, um, I suppose. So it's, it's, you know, there's just, so many things that could happen it seems like every time it's like a sweat at the end it's like you need a guy to make a putt or etc or you need to dodge a dodge a birdie um even even when our two guys bur uh parred that last hole the bird the birdies couldn't hurt us but then i was i looked at her and i was like all right these guys each have a hundred yard shot we just need them to not make it and so right. i'm just like i'm like I don't even want the ball bouncing near the hole. I don't, yeah. I just, please just like, you don't need that, a, that kind of sweat. Yeah. Yeah, right. Um, wait, wait, but so, so going back to this, right. I, I took it as you given it as an example, but I want you to finish the story. Also, did your guy get the birdie streak? Did he make the birdie to, to get three? No, in a row? the first 50 K. No, uh, okay. that was um, in March or something. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. no, no, he didn't. Bummer. He okay. did not. And then the next right. day, the same guy um, had a chance like golf. <laughs> Golf is crazy. I don't know. I'm sure it happens in other sports, right? Um, but the very next day was round four, and we were and had a sweat. And the um, the guy was it was the same guy, Shane Lowry, who's you know, he's playing the Masters this week. He was mm -hmm. sort of near the near the lead. And when he steps on the 18th tee, he's in the very last group, so he's in the last group. And I'm looking, I'm playing both round four main and round four captain slate. And I have lineups near the top in both. <laughs> and uh, Wyndham Clark is on the green and Wyndham Clark has like a 40 footer for birdie. And I'm not really paying much attention. And I'm, but I'm looking at the DraftKings leaderboards and I realize that if Lowry makes a birdie, I'm going to hop up. It's worth like 15 K to me. And so I was like, oh, okay, great. And right when I realized that Wyndham Clark made like a 40 footer for birdie and then everything changed and so then i looked at the leaderboard again and i go he was actually on another lineup that benefited like five grand from him making that putt oh, wow. and then i looked and i go oh gosh if lowry makes birdie on the last hole now it's going to cost us 10 grand oh, God. <laughs> because because it, it it would hurt the lineup that yeah, we, we got like, passed by some other lineup so now we yeah. were blocked from the lead in the big contest and so right. it's just like now we're trying to hold on to this i mean it's just yeah it just happens like it definitely happens you know, in other sports too M yeah. maybe not to the same extent or maybe not as like chronologically where it's like easy to yeah. track with that definitely happens in sports where yeah. it's like i'm it, cheering yeah, for one outcome like and it's like oh shit now i can't cheer for that anymore yeah yeah it'd be like an nfl slate where you're playing the main slate and you also played the showdown slate and yeah. it's like in the same slate. So you got, you know, you might have a situation where something is really good for showdown, not so good for classic. Yeah. But maybe the payouts are bigger on classic. So you want that to happen, you know, you get sort yeah. of some funny things. Actually, th this past weekend, I played uh, UFL and my, my biggest stand was played a lot of the DC defenders, which I know you don't know anything. I, I assume you don't know anything about UFL spring football, but um, I, I was cheering very much for Jordan Tayamu and the DC defenders. And then uh, the opposing defense scored a touchdown almost immediately got a, got a pick six and i was like oh god that really helps me in a showdown it's like yeah, <laughs> it, it's funny how yeah. we do these things that are like benefits you in one place hurts you in another and it's not even yeah. like intentional hedging it's just i don't know just the way we play the yeah games. yeah that, um, that is that is amazing I, I, so i wanted to ask you about uh one of the specific things i wanted to touch on with golf is so i had uh jeremy q king our mutual friend was on 
this show a couple weeks ago and he was talking about he loves round four pga showdown like that that seems to be his jam is that also your favorite like is round four just the the softest yeah, so contest or? i i heard i i listened to the i listened yeah. to a lot i caught up on the podcast um when i was coming back from vacation uh and i did i and i've had this disagreement i think with quite a few people actually okay where that is a fairly commonly held position that round four um i think round four is the if I were to rate the rounds, um, the second lowest edge round. That, that would have been my guess. Okay. Um, and That's actually, round one. yes. So um, round one is tough because um, I'm not as it's harder to predict what people are going to do. So round one is the lowest edge. Um, round four is the second lowest edge. It's and I think it and it, it that it may have changed in this like uh, Jeremy's point was that because of the finish points, it makes the game a little bit more complicated and people mm -hmm. uh, mess it up. I think that was more the case um, a while ago. Uh, I think people were playing it really poorly um, a while ago and now not very poorly at all. And then okay. the finish points sort of erode the edge, the projection edge a little bit. Um, and, it, and it and it reduces, you know, one of the edges in, in golf comes from the variance basically yeah. you know if you're not correctly accounting for the variance um you know then you might not be doing something correctly and there's less variance in round four i mean only like yeah is it what like 65 guys make the cut uh i mean there are, there's probably like 30 or 40 viable people to play on round four so it like shrinks the you know, because because pool. they're not in content others are not in contention for finishing points or, or right why, yeah why, because yeah. of the finishing you know of course if like the course is playing super easy then people are more viable down the down the right. board because um, you get because, more points for birdies and stuff that are going to offset yeah so like yeah like well yeah i mean the finishing points are stat you know they're the same every tournament the scoring points vary if the scoring is really easy then you're going to get a lot of scoring points and then finish points um make up a smaller percent of your total points whereas if the course is really hard there's not much scoring points and then finish points make up a huge portion of your final score so um but people have gotten much better at that so i think in a second worst um edge round and then rounds two and three are the best um two is great just because there's still a lot of options um to choose and and sometimes in two and three you have course you know, sometimes they're playing multiple courses, which can play um, a fairly large factor. Okay. Interesting. So that's, that's, you know, I would say it's the influence of the previous rounds and that there's a lot of options to that are still viable to choose from. And the more options you give people, the generally, um, the more mistakes they will make. Okay. Interesting. Wait, so you would, you would rank them as far as the, the biggest edge in PGA showdown, would be round two is the biggest edge because you still have a lot of the field, a lot of golfers in the field. So people, uh, players are more and more likely to make big mistakes, but also yeah. you don't get finishing points and people are overreacting to round one, followed by round yeah. three, followed by round one, followed by round four. Yeah. I can't remember what, whether it's, I can't remember the order of two and three, but um, okay. they're, they're quite ahead of four and four is barely ahead of one. Okay. Although I've, I've, I think I've had the most success in round one, which is, you know, just speaks to it being, you know, a lot of variance. Right. It was just, I just got, I just ran hot in round one. I don't know what to yeah. say about it. That's, that's, the but my Sims tell me that uh, my edge is not as big in round one as it is, um, in other, in other, uh, rounds. Interesting. Yeah. And the only other, yeah, he said one, the, the only other thing I, the only other gripe I think I had on that was it, it just from a, a DFS um general standpoint was um he said like it was uh some sports were a mme sport um and i you know i would i would you know i think just from a theory standpoint like if you cannot make one good lineup to play in a gpp you definitely should not be playing 150. oh so, yeah he, he said nfl showdown is an mme contest 
Is right. Like yeah. I, I don't know what, I don't, I can't remember what I sport think. it was, but it but yeah, I just, my theory brain was like that, can, and that, you know, cannot be true. Um, you know, because if you can't make one good lineup, how are you going to make 150 good lineups? So I, I think it was more of a factor that the variance is so high. Right. Um, but I get into that a lot with um, people that will say one thing that I, you know, disagree with is like, can you play a player too much? And, you know, some people will be like, yeah, you can roster someone, you know, but they'll look at someone's lineup set and they'll go, oh, he played 60% of this guy. The guy, he's, he's terrible. And right. I go, and you, you just go, okay, well, did you play any single entry lineups this week? And they go, yeah. And I go, well, you played a hundred percent of every single person on your single entry lineup. So, right. you know, there's obviously risk mitigation and, you know, uh, competing lineups versus each other. Um, but you know, I don't, I don't think you can make like black and white rules, right. um, you know, sort of like that. Yeah. And that's, I mean, unless it's like, it's impossible to make 150 plus EV lineups with that player, I guess that would be like the, you can't play that player in 150 lineups because they're, yeah, I would think, well, I mean, I, mean like, I don't, I don't, yeah, right. That's a, that's a good point, uh, which is sort of an interesting point. I think, Maybe Brick has talked about this before, but I didn't. I meant I would like. I meant to take a look at this, but um, you know, when I submit lineups, um, certainly even in post contest sims, um, every lineup I submit is not plus EV. Um, just as a factor of maybe yeah. I got some of the ownership wrong for multiple players in that in that lineup, um, and I think that's you know. Um, I think, you know, some of the points I've heard, you know, players talk about is like, how can you trying to identify, uh, you know, their bad lineups and it's sometimes it's just tricky. It's just like, yeah, there's no, like, I don't think you can get like, if you're going to, if you're like, I don't want to play 150 lineups. I want to, you know, every time like 50, of my lineups are no good or, or they're, you know, they're like sort of break even. So I'm just going to play a hundred lineups. Well, I think when you will play a hundred lineups, this ratio will be the same. It'll be like, okay, you're down to 100 lineups. Well, 66% of them will be good, and a third of them will still be bad, just because of, um, you know, how you're, how, you know, creating your lineups and the exposures you're limiting yourself to, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I, I think, in general, it's, it's, to me, I don't think you can go. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go from 150 lineups where I have some bad ones to I'm gonna play 100 lineups and sort of assume that you're going to be able to remove all the bad ones. There's just some factors out yeah. of your control that you just you have can't to predict do. exactly what the field is going to do. So right. it's like if you, you could you predict, know. if you like, if you were very good at predicting what the field could do, then you could do that. But then of course you would just slam as many lineups because you're obviously right. a fortune teller. Yeah. So um, there's some variance related to just what the, what actually happens in the, when the field is making lineups that you can't account for. There's just, it's just not possible for you to account for. Yeah. No, that's definitely, definitely fair. Um, and it's, I mean, <laughs> they're, they're, for, for, for people who are like, like you and Brick, I assume you and Brick are, uh, when you're submitting lineups, your lineups are at least plus EV in your pre-contest sim. So that, that's, a, that's oh, yeah, yeah. They're like, like uh, you know, Blender and I, we, we did a, a podcast where he would refer to like some of the lineups that he submits or, or that I submit just using an optimizer. I don't know. He, he I think he's gotten more advances than like we call them loss leaders. They're just like, I probably submit lineups that, Maybe they're not good when I submit them. Like I, I, I know I could look at them and be like, "This is a, a negative EV lineup." Okay, so um, yeah, that lineup be like you could certainly cut that lineup. Um, right, right. Yeah, well, I mean, difference. you should you should probably like go through and, and be like, okay, uh, like have some sort of rules or whatever. Just be like, yeah. all right, this lineup violates like three of my rules. I'm just like, there's right. no way I'm I'm submitting it. Yeah. Um, but that's a different thing. But yeah. Being negative EV yeah. in pre contest sims versus when you actually know what the field played obviously is a different thing. Yeah. And so that's interesting, you know, yeah. Like I'm sure when I run round one later, when I run it, it'll, it'll spit out, like, uh, give me a lineup set and it'll be like, Hey, you know, we think these lineups are going to be X ROI. And then I'll, and then I'll run the post contest sims and I'll be like, okay, was I close? Was the project, you know, what does my post contest sim ROI look like? And, um, generally, it, you know, the, if I did a good job projecting, then it's fairly close, which is nice. And if I didn't, then sometimes it's down. I mean, there I, I've had, you know, and, I, you know, 
I've I've worked quite hard on um, uh, <laughs> my vacuum is going to go off. Um, nice. I work quite hard on sort of making sure my sims make sense and like the distributions are correct and uh, you know stuff like that. So, um, but there, you know, so not all the time am I even the highest ROI person in my own sims. So it's, you know, that happens from time to time where yeah. someone else will be the highest. And so that, that really would never happen if your projections are really far off market. Like if, if your, if your projections were just like kind of in left field, you would always, you know, you would always be the highest simmer and probably by a pretty large margin. Right. Um, the thing that sort of gives me confidence in my process is, you know, sometimes the top simmer varies and um, a lot of times it is someone that I have a really good history of knowing that they are also very, very good at yeah. PGA DFS. Yeah, I know you talked about some of those players on Lowell's and it's like, yeah, these, these are all the, the best. I, I'm going to, I'll ask you to reiterate that. Um, but, um, well, I mean, this is, we're, we're getting to the point where I usually close these up. So I want to just ask you, how are you doing? Do you need to grab a beer? Do you, nah, do you need yeah, to? Yeah, let, let me go grab a beer. I'll be right back. Okay. I got some time. All right. I'm going to cool. cut off this uh, back. All right. Cool, cool. Love it. I, I wasn't sure if Nelson was going to, you know, need to, need to bail right now, uh, but grab another beer. We are in a perfect position so I can ask a few more questions of Nelson. Of course, if anybody else has questions for Nelson, we, we probably aren't going to be on here for too much longer. Um, he's getting another beer, so maybe we'll buy another 20 minutes or so, but not forever. Um, yeah, exactly right. Uh, Zach, I actually don't know who has the record for the longest episode. It might be, I don't know if Zach went over two hours. I think Adam probably went over two hours, uh, but we are, we're definitely going to hit the record, I think, tonight. Um <laughs> Usually, like you can two sleep hours. before the Masters. That I mean, I'm gonna go upstairs and just like yeah, pray exactly. to God that Tiger Woods figures out a way to walk 72 yeah. holes in the next four days. <laughs> Are, did, did you actually? Do you actually have any Tiger in your lineups? <laughs> did, uh, let me see. I did. I did not um, look even at who I. I got told you guys I was gonna on. trick Nelson into giving me the plays. Uh, let me. This see. is how you do it. I'm just gonna search for Tiger. Let's see if I. Okay, I got one. I got one. <laughs> right, I made so. uh, before this. I, I think I still have. Um, I think I'm, I registered for the ten dollar milli and the five dollar drive the green. Um, so I'm gonna make another. I have to make another hundred and fifty lineups. Um, I've made so I, I've got one tiger lineup right now. So um, it's not looking good for tiger. You, you need to I, make another I, 150 for what contest? For I'll the, play different round one 150 showdown? in the two in the two different contests. Okay, for for the round one showdown. No, for the drive the green. oh the drive the green for the for the okay gotcha gotcha and the ten dollar okay. milli mm -hmm. nice. Um, oh, Cal, right. Cali's on the light money on fire train. I see. All right. See good luck. That. Good luck to you, Cali. Um, so this is a, this is a question for you because I don't really play a ton of showdown. Uh, but do you hedge your classic lineups by playing the shorter turbo slates slash tiers? The action seems soft. Uh, what, what do you do? Do, do you uh, do you hedge at all with your? I've, classic I've played tier. I used to. I played tiers before, and then I it just was taking up too much time to uh, do more work. I wouldn't. I wouldn't call it hedging. I would say, you know, if you it, it's generally in your best interest. If you think you have an edge to play, play as many slates as you can, just helps with, um, you know, trying to realize your equity. Yeah, that you know that would be my, sort of my thinking. Um, but I I, 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 I wouldn't let um, my decisions on the classic slate or another slate affect my decisions on the subsequent slate. I, I have heard. It, for, for like for NFL, so it's 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 not uh, entirely the same thing, uh, but like we, we I think we talked about this last week. Maybe me and J and B talked about it. Uh, but like whistles, we'll play like we'll lock in a, a really low owned quarterback in the millimaker, maker, but that's like a very small percentage of his bankroll. But then he won't play that player in high stakes. So like we'll, we'll say Gardner Minshew, whatever he plays him, locks him into 150 of his 
millimaker, low, low stakes millimaker contest, but then doesn't play him in high stakes. So like doesn't actually have that larger percentage of field, but plays him where it makes the most sense, where there is like, it's the largest field, like you really need things to go nuclear to win. Um, so you play the higher variant style, which um, I assume that, that he's also not hedging though. It's like you, you are hedging in a way, but yeah, like, I, I think that's, more, I think that's just, I don't, I would say it's just pure strategy. Uh, yeah. You know, in a, in a larger contest, you're, more free to play players that are, you know, projected significantly worse, um, yeah. just because you need the ceiling outcome. Um, you know, you gotta be careful in the smaller contests that you're not playing people that are off the map too much. Otherwise you'll just, you're just giving up too much projection edge and, um, you just, you can't overcome it with the, yeah. um, with the leverage you might create. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, I, so I have some basic questions, but I think I'm going to skip over. Well, I, I guess I'll say, do, do you sweat the games? Like, do, do you, uh, I mean, I yeah. know you play most <laughs> of sounds like you do. Yeah. I mean, I, but I'm just a golf fan in general. So, right. Um, You're going to be watching anyway. Be, yeah. Yeah. I'm going to be, um, yeah, I, I could do better at that. And that's sort of, you know, hopefully what I tried to make the cut sweats thing in that regard. So I could just like look at my showdown summary and like, do I have any live lineups? If I don't, then try to just, do anything else um you know this week for sure i'll just be tuned in all the time but um i'm sure my my wife would uh um appreciate it if i wasn't looking at the phone so much yeah i mean we, we can all relate to that yeah um how, how many good pga dfs players are there in your opinion like plus ev and maybe we'll, we'll say well i mean i'm sure there are good single entry players but like uh, how many good players do you think there are who are entering in large field contests more than like 50 lineups every week, every contest? Uh, the pool is pretty small in PGA. Uh, of got like of guys that are playing every week, it's gonna be it's gonna be pretty. It's probably like 15 guys or you know 15 DFS people. I would say um, to mal- like this week, the contest will be bigger. The Masters contest will be bigger. I'll. And the edge will probably be bigger because of casuals. So I, you know, this week you'll see probably quite a few people every day that have you know a decent edge. Okay. But it it'll depend on, um, you know, how small the contest. You know, it varies by week depending on how popular the golf tournament itself is, how big DraftKings made the contest, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Interesting. Um, I'm going to ask this next question in two different ways. Uh, so who is on your DFS Mount Rushmore and then who is on your PGA DFS Mount Rushmore? Oh man. Um, I mean, I would put Dink to me is like one of the best DFS players. Um, you know, just the longevity and the success that he's had. Um, yeah. you know, w- I, you know, I would defer then to the bots, I guess, like nerdy, uh, whistles, yeah. those guys. Um, yeah uh that that sort of you know have just changed the game and really um you know it's impressive that they're able to you know dfs in general is like you can kind of you you can move from one sport to the other because the concept is you know uh very similar but it is always interesting to see people that have success across so many sports and just like the time um that it takes to literally you know be plugged into all these different things they're just i mean i can't nba i just cannot even believe that people play that sport i mean it just seems <laughs> you got to really love it i would guess and i just it's I the, it's the biggest edge like in my opinion three nba lineups in my life oh i i love nba dfs like i i think it's it's fun but i also i'm an nba fan and i also think that there is the biggest edge in nba so um so i yeah i guess um that, yeah, that's and why I, love it. I would love so I have this data set for golf, right? That is it's probably if you and if you were doing I don't have the projections for classic. I don't like sim for for showdown I simulate every single contest. Like at the end of the week, I'll just go back sim every contest, see what the actual results for every contest was and I have this. So it's like for showdown I probably have like a few million lineups and contests. And for classic I have way more, but I don't do all it's just too large of a data set to do this for um but i can go back and look and see like okay what you know over the over a very long period 
what were the projections like? What were the actual points like? Um, like, what if I, if I look at the actual points, are people like annihilating the field? Like, are you like, is your team's always scoring more points than everybody? And in golf, that's not the case. Um, right. You know, if, you know, um, like I said earlier, my team, my average team barely beats the field as far as a projection is concerned. So I would, I would, I would love to see that NBA because I've always heard the NBA is like this and, and makes sense to me because it's just like it's so much ball knowing, like they, yeah. you know, these rotations and stuff. And to me, it would be very interesting if you had a huge data set to look at. You know, I assume like people like Petty beat the field huge on a projection basis. And that's yeah. just like, like I said earlier, it's just like, that is the ultimate generator of edge in DFS. If you can beat, if you have like, if you just score more points than everybody, and then you're, and if your lineup is just like, and no one else is playing those guys because they don't know that they're projected so high, that is where you get the huge edge. In, in golf, yeah. projection and ownership are like insanely linear correlated. Like a right. lineup that is very highly owned is going to score more points. There's no doubt about it. Um, but you know that that could change in sports where you have a big projection edge and people yeah. just aren't rostering the best plays. Well, they're, they're but I would the, love the, to see the edge. I would love to see how much the best NBA players, how much they're beating the field by. Like, is it one percent? Is it two? Is it like I don't know? It could be it could be three percent. I have no three percent would be astronomical in my opinion. Yeah. Um, so I, I would guess are, that it'd be a huge edge. Huge. So, but but it's a combination of like you have the just the projection edge, just like knowing ball better than the rest of us. But then also just like late like late swapping for the projection changing rapidly. Like sometimes like with minutes to spare before, and like being able to rapidly update your projections for this lineup being different than you expected, this player being injured, and now yeah. you have to reallocate all these minutes. Like if you're able to do all that kind of stuff, it wouldn't surprise me if if guys like Petty just have that huge of an edge um yeah and and, and, that, and, even... and so and that sort of see, like the you know DraftKings is sort of re you know introducing the no no late swap games right and like that sort of goes back to where i think that the relationship between players and DraftKings is quite adversarial yeah and that if they think that people are the regs and the good pros are fleecing the fish too hard because of late swap, they will just take late swap away and then the edge goes down and then people's money lasts a little bit longer and they can rake a little bit more. Yep. Yeah, that definitely, definitely makes sense. Um, Ed, Matt, uh, first of all, I want to touch on your, your Mount Rushmore. I got to say, I think that you were, I think this is the, you're the first person who brought up Dink as being on, and actually, and Nerdy. I think both of those are first timers on uh, on Mount Rushmore's when I have asked this question. And I think both very warranted. Like Dink has posted uh, his. I mean, the Dink, yeah, that, it's results. really surprising to me that, you know. Yeah, he, he's, he's not usually brought up. And it's usually like the, you know, the Chipotle bros, which they're, they're obviously very uh, deserving as well. But like I've seen like Dink's graphs, like his 1% graphs or like his, um, you know, just like actual results. Like, damn, uh, he's. Yeah, I, yeah, I mean, there. It's, it's crazy. I, I, and then nerdy, yeah. nerdy is like newer, like, but like still, it's just been clearly crushing and also just like uh, very, very, very good in, in a, at this one, not that short time of a time frame. Like he's been around a few years at least. Yeah, a few years. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I, I've talked with him um, a good, he has a poker background, obviously. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, you have to put the guy that ruined DFS on Mount Rushmore. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How can you exactly. leave him off? Yeah, exactly. Um, all right, I want to get to uh, Ed Mass asked you, and he said this is a question about spe uh, above is specific to PGA level variants. He says, at what point does a theoretically under owned play become a dumb slash fish play? Is is there a point there where where a theoretically under owned play becomes a fish play? Yeah, I mean, if, if they're, it, um, let's see, the contest side, the structure and the size of the contest matters a lot. So yeah. If the the flatter the payout, you know, the less you can mess around. The smaller the field, typically, the less you can mess around. So, um, if you're playing different contests, you would want like there are people that you can play in one cost one contest that you cannot play. In the ten dollar milli so, th this week is a great example of like you can probably play yeah. anybody in that, right? The ten dollar milli. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. You, I, I would assume in the ten dollar like 
I'll say this in the $10 milli, you might be able to make a plus EV lineup with every, not okay, not every single person in the field, but a very, very large percentage of people in the field. That's interesting. So yes. I would have guessed every golfer in the field, to be honest. I would have guessed. Uh, I don't know. Some like, of these, some of these yeah, old, like, I, I, well, if you take out the old guys, if you take out like, the guys that literally have no chance. Okay. I didn't um, realize that there are anybody that has, because Phil just won a couple of years ago. So like, I, I guess well, I, I'm, right. not, I'm not well, a golf Phil, player. Like, <laughs> I don't know if you've looked at Phil's results recently, but I have, I was shy. I had it. I don't follow live obviously, but I looked at how he's played and it is almost alarming how bad it is. Okay. Um, I mean, he's, I mean, did you, have you looked at the odds board by chance? Um, the Oz I'm, I'm going to pull this is. up right now here and just say, uh, I mean, the consensus, the Phil, uh, I mean, he's a, I guess he's 0.3% to win is the consensus market uh, position. Um, but I mean, he's, there's only 20 guys below him, but like the masters, if you're sort of on, if you're not familiar yeah, you get the lifetime invite. So yeah, yeah. you have guys in the field like Jose Maria Olathabal, who the guy must, he's got to be in his, he's got to be like 65. He might be 70. Um, so like, I just reacted as though like, yeah, obviously I know that. I learned this last night because I did a PGA stream with <laughs> yeah. uh, with Fresh, what was on the right. stream. So like, I mean, the bottom of the board is, this. yeah, the bottom of the board is all past champions. You know, Jose Maria Olathabal, Mike Weir, VJ Singh, uh, okay. Fred Couples, all those guys like that. Well, I guess that's the only past champions it used to be older guys. Um, you probably have to exclude those guys. You have to exclude some of these AMs that qualify um, from either the USAM or sometimes the USAM champ is really good. I'm not sure. Well, I guess it's Nick Dunn. No, it can't be Nick Dunlap because he, uh, he went pro. I guess he qualified anyway. I guess it, it actually, I think is Nick Dunlap, but because he won the, um, tournament he qualified even if he turned pro so if the masters is strange they give a spot to the usam champ um okay. but you cannot turn pro before the masters or you lose huh. that exemption and he turned pro because he won and since he won he got the invite so he was in a okay. no lose situation yeah Good um problem. so yeah so i would say in the ten dollar milli you can go you can make a, a profitable lineup with just about any person in the field down except for let's say the last 10 guys that is not the case in probably even the 100 milli or the definitely not the case in the 222 milli which i think also sort of answers so tj asked how much do you cut your player pool for the masters? Well, it depends on which contest you're playing in the masters. It sounds like, so it's, I mean, you, you kind of just gave your, your answer for the $10 would be like the bottom 10 in terms of odds of winning. You just cut out of your player pool, even for the $10. Uh, but I, I, yeah, I mean, a, a right. Smaller, I, I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't, I, I don't do any like, like hard line stuff like that, but right. Yeah. What, what we just talked about would be a similar, you're not gonna a get similar guideline. It would, yeah. it depends on the contest you're playing. Okay. Like, like, a, I mean, the extreme example is a double up. I mean, can't play any of these guys. It's just like, you know, that's the, that's the opposite end of the spectrum versus the $10 milli. Um, all right. So, so in general in PGA DFS, so, so like I said, I, I suck at PGA DFS. I've had a couple like decent sweats, but in general, it's just a straight downward line. I've talked to better DFSers than myself who have had similar PGA DFS results. Um, and I, I know you, you, it sounds like you're more of a showdown guy than a classic guy, but you do run Sims and stuff for classic. Uh, yeah, so I, that, I, I mean, that, like I said, the edge is, the edge is there. Um, here's a, here's a, a really good way to um, quantify it is like, I have a year and a half of showdown data. So if I look at my showdown data and my showdown Sims, the people that I think are plus EV, like if, if I just look at the plus EV, it's not, it's not like if you just, I'm just not, I'm not looking at it at the lineup level. I'm looking at it at the DFS entry name level, like, uh, okay. next world champ or, uh, you know, mock loving or whatever. Right. But if I, so I look at, I summarize the whole, um, year and it, if I think your lineups overall are net positive, like 
they were going to produce some EV. I grouped all of those people together and I like charted out their results. And so that group, I predicted them to be up half a million dollars and they were actually up like 600,000 or something like that. Very close to the projection. Yeah. And the opposite, you know, the losers were projected to be down 2.8 million and they were down 2.8 and change. So it was good. Um, or close, you know, real, it seemed realistic or, you know, yeah. pretty well calibrated. Yeah. So then I went and I looked at, I said, okay, let's take all of these good, sh the, these good showdown players that I've identified and go look and see how they've done. I don't have classic Sims, but I could see how they've done in actual classic results. And for the same time period, the people that were expected to be up half a million and were in fact up 600,000 in showdown, those people are down $3 million in classic PGA. Jesus, okay. On like, uh, how much an entry fees? I can't, I won't be able to think off the top of my head, but probably like over 20 million in entry fees, maybe 30 okay. million. Okay, so, so they're far, down so like 10%, not, negative 10% ROI. Yeah, it's not crazy, not but, um, and then, and then, and so then, and, and then I looked at, the people who actually win in classic and I went and I looked at their showdown results and they are running hot in showdown. And I think it's because they basically roster the same guys. And so if the guys do good in classic, they do good in showdown. Yeah. And so those guys that are winning in classic are not winners in showdown or not winners in my Sims, not but they are so actual winners because of their actual results. So it's, you know, I think that's a good, that's probably the best way to sort of exempt, you know, talk about the variance is like, yeah, when we have a big sample, like the people win, but classic is, you know, not many slates and, you know, the field sizes are, they're just, the field sizes are humongous. That's a, that's a big thing. Yeah. All right. So let's talk about the, the $10 million. Let's say somebody wants to max enter the $10 Millie maker tomorrow on DraftKings. What would you say is closer to correct? So I'm 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 picturing uh, Kobe. Kobe Dubose plays like you look at some of his lineups, like sub ten percent cumulative ownership, like really really low owned lineups. I've I don't seen, know what the, I've seen some of those. I don't know what the inverse is. Maybe I don't know if it's Hooper. Like who who is the the guy that just like plays the really highly projected but really high owned lineups? I'm not sure exactly who that would be. Um, but what do you think is closer to like what you want to do in the ten dollar? Like do do you want your lineups to be sub 30% cumulative ownership or, or should you I think? Yeah. I mean, I think there's a threshold for sure. Like, um, okay. I've, I've actually been, I have seen some of, um, his lineups. Sometimes they're in higher stakes stuff and I have actually been wrong. You know, I would be like, wow, I don't think that, I don't think you can play a lineup like this in that contest. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then I'll sim it and it, and sometimes it's actually not wildly plus EV, but plus EV. It's not like, I would think it's, wow, lighting money on fire. Or like right. when I look at it, I was like, there's no chance this lineup is good. And then it ended up being like decent, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't nearly as bad. I mean, it was a good lineup. So yeah, there are some, um, you know, I would say you want to be closer to, if, if you're talking about the $10 million specifically, closer to off the wall than, um, uh, yeah. You know, you know, duping is not really a well. Duping will be a concern in the milli. Um, in the ten dollars milli, extent. really? Yeah, okay, I mean, I suppose, yeah, small field. Yeah, there, I mean, there's just so many. I mean, you only got eighty nine guys. Seventy five of them are rosterable, so there's just not that many. Com I mean, there are a lot of combos, but you're gonna, you're definitely gonna have some pretty big trains um, in the in the. But generally in golf, it's not really a concern because you got 156 guys to, um, you know, talk about, but right. That, you know, that's, you know, uh, people I think have beat the dupe horse to death on, they finally, you know, figured out that, uh, you know, when you're duped, you win less of the money. And when you lose, you lose the same amount you would have lost if you weren't duped. So, right. Uh, people have figured out like, okay, that's bad to do. You still want highly projected lineups in general or lineups that have a shot at winning. Yeah. Yeah, um, and then, you, and then you, you can certainly do it to 
too much. Um, so that's that's the that's the balancing act. Yeah, you can't just like willy nilly launch, you know, crazy low, um, like because in golf, because ownership is so highly correlated to their um, actual results. If you like, if people are not rostering them in golf, it's because they know not to roster all those guys at the same time. Yeah. In yeah. the same line. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. Um, not Eom sure. says it has to be Big T is the example that he would give as somebody who plays like really highly owned lineups. But Big T is just like, I, I thought his thing is like, he just like cuts players out of his player pool. Just like, I'm not playing this guy, doesn't have a big enough noodle or whatever. Just like he, he cuts people, <laughs> players out of his player. Does he also play pretty high? Yeah, I mean, he, he does. Lineups? He generally does play um, one of the more extreme style extreme yeah. ownership styles which i don't think some people think that is inherently wrong like i said right. earlier i do not i do not think that is a sign that someone is playing poorly poorly okay. um but you know anyone who's producing content you know get, is in a tricky and releasing who they who they want to play right you know to people that you are competing against um you know it's it's not it's certainly not beneficial um, for your lineups. So, um, you know, he probably gets uh, duped a little bit more frequently just from his subs, you know, playing. Um, yeah, I mean, they, so, they had the NFL, the NFL showdown was probably the best example of Big T gave out like his exact lineup once and they all won together. They all held hands and won, you know, 1500 well, bucks you, on a. When you pick the winners, winners, it doesn't, it doesn't matter how yeah, many people which, you share with. Yeah, which at that point, it's like, yeah, he definitely, he would have won a lot more if he did not. You know, have to do the content sharing it with the everybody. Um, yeah. I'm a loser till I win the maker. Uh, till I win the millie. Asks, what are three golfers he should start with? <laughs> so he's good. This this is where I said I was going to try to trick you into giving me the masters plays. Uh, if he wants to get away from Scotty, who who are some uh, some good golfers to play here? Golly day. Yeah. Um, you I'm don't you don't really have to. This is also supposed no. to be an evergreen. Uh, kind of podcast, so like not. I wasn't actually meaning yeah. to. I mean, I don't. Yeah, yeah I mean, I don't it. particularly care about um, giving. I mean, I'll say it because yeah. it's actionable for what like six hours, so it doesn't. Right. It doesn't. Uh, True. It doesn't particularly matter. I mean, I, you know, looks to me like Scotty is like uh, fairly. You know, I, I would say Scotty is not a big decision maker um, in lineups tomorrow. So like. You don't have like you don't have to get away from him. Right. Um, it's not it's not it's not he's not like one of the worst plays. I mean he'll is be pretty unless he came in at like uh, over forty percent owned. I right. guess would be like when he started to get like to the point where like you could still make plus EV lineups with him. It's just you might not want to slam it. Um, it would be hard maybe to. Um, but yeah, that that would be uh, um, a you know. A, a tricky one. Other people near the top of the board. I mean, you know, th there's going to be a battle for Brooks. Um, you know, you've got the data guys that are like Brooks sucks, and then you've got the ball knowers that are, well, it's freaking Brooks in a major. Um, right. So, I mean, yeah, uh, you might get if you run some sites on just like some ran, you know, some small randomness. Uh, you might get zero Brooks and he's projected to be like 18%. So, you know, that's a fairly, you know, it, you know, you're, you're like, you know, how can it, how can the, some of the sources that people use, like you literally get no Brooks when you run their stuff and then, right. but he's projected to be 18%. And so like people just must be clicking them in, uh, clicking them Thanks. in manually. Um, so I, I did a PGA best ball stream last night with our fresh um, where we talked where he like set rankings for me based on like uh, based on data golf rankings, I want to say, and uh, world golf rankings and like very a lot of different factors. And Brooks like has an ADP of 4.9, I want to say in this is PGA best ball contest on underdog. And he had him ranked like 35th. <laughs> so that's an example of like, yeah, you're just not going to get him based on like anything like data wise but then he still gave the advice of like but you don't want to have zero brooks so you should just like manually click him in occasionally because he can win um yeah the, yeah the, i mean yeah certainly i mean certainly a tricky spot i mean i would have brooks what do i even have brooks at i mean uh like just my i mean 
I take, I do a lot of, um, I use a lot of market influence on like my final um, figures, but I'm just like scrolling down. I don't even see Brooks uh, anywhere in my rankings. I mean, he's, oh, there he is. Uh, in my raw model, Brooks is the 32nd best golfer in the world. I think he had him 35th so, in terms of the best ball ranking. So, yeah, I mean, he's, he has played, he played really bad this last week. I don't, you know, but people probably, you know, paying attention to him and he could be the guy you know that's the thing about live is um like phil has been playing horrible on live um, right. and, and it's one of the things that the official world golf rankings has you know sort of balked at is yeah. that you know on the pga tour you can be fairly confident that every single person is going out there and giving it their all every single time so then you know ranking those golfers is easy just like rank the results if, if, if motivation is something that is in flux right. or you're not confident with it, you know, it's just, it's just like a, you know, a weekend golfer that goes out and, you know, submits scores that they don't really care about. And then when it comes to crunch time, they actually try, um, right. you know, it, I, I, I don't like Brooks, um, <laughs> mostly because I, I, it drives me nuts. There was a, a viral video this week of him uh, and people were talking about him being like one of the mentally, mentally toughest golfers, you know, <laughs> that have existed. Right. Yeah. Because of his major record, which is good. He right. has won five majors. Well, you know, Brooks has like, I mean, I'll probably botch this, but I think he has, I'll look it up. He has like, before I say it, he doesn't have many other PGA Tour wins, right? Is what I'll say. And so you go, okay, you know, the guy couldn't turn it on one time, uh, you know, on a regular week, or or he just thinks like the regular weeks are such a laughing stock, he's not even trying. Right. And then you're just like, okay, like you're not even trying, like that's kind of messed up, right? Yeah, it's right. Like you're just going out there, just I mean, he has one, two. Okay, he's won he's won four regular PGA events, and he's won and five, five majors. That's crazy. I mean, yeah. yeah. And yeah, so it's, it's it's funny and, that the takeaway it, is that he, oh he's mentally tough because he wins these ones. Where it's like no, that means he's not usually giving it. He's not usually putting in all the mental work that you need to put in to win all the other. Right. Contests. I mean, the the other comparison is the only the other mentally toughest golfer that I know of is Tiger Woods, and he wins majors. At about the same clip that he won regular PJ tour events. Right. You know, he just was, you know, putting in you know, you know, just every day giving it his all and exerting the mental effort to do that. And yeah. if you're just taking weeks off, you know, sorry, but I'm not gonna give you uh the mental uh the mental, mental toughness, toughness award. award. Yeah. That's kind of bullshit. Yeah. No, yeah. I'm with you. I'm with you on that. That's uh it's a weird position to take that he's mentally tough because he's only good in, in these contests. Only yeah. Oh, it's good. the only one he tries at. I mean, yeah. okay, well then I think you're a jerk you're an asshole for just like right. not not trying regularly. Yeah. Or like um, I don't care about these events or whatever. Right. Um, all right. I, I, so you gave me your your PGA you, you gave me your overall DFS Mount Rushmore. I don't think you gave me your PGA DFS Mount Rushmore unless you meant like I don't think Dink plays a ton of PGA. So I don't think he was. I think he was on your your main uh, DFS Mount Rushmore. Yep. Who, who um, was on your PGA? On. One second. I'll do it. I'll okay. look at it real quick. Okay. Um, I mean, I could do it. Off oh, you're gonna look at you're gonna look at data to to, to yeah. answer this question. Uh, I love it. Yeah, I'll just. Uh, Take this and take a second for this to just run. But um... while you're doing that, I got a I got a note that I have a, another sweat going on while we're doing this, which is Timberwolves are playing the Nuggets right now, and we are getting very close to the end of the season. Uh, the winner of this game like has a big edge in terms of being first overall in the Western Conference, which. I don't think the Timberwolves are. I, I wasn't a big Timberwolves fan in the early 2000s. Maybe they've done it before, but they've got a real shot at, at winning the Western Conference if they win this game. So I'm like kind of sweating that. They're up 70 65 halfway through the third quarter. Okay, that's good. You yeah. got to hop on. Is that watch playback thing? Is it a is it a subscription service or, or, or how does that work? I've seen like something like some sort of sweat. What can you tell so, me about that? 
So I, I I'm not involved with watch play. I've, I've actually had conversations with uh, the, the guy who works there reached out to me like, Hey, do you want to join this platform? Uh, and, and maybe I will at some point, but uh, so, so they are a service where you can watch the games. Um, if you have uh, NBA league pass, like if you already have NBA league pass, like, so like uh, run pure sports, Sto- stochastic ETR, I know they all do it where it's like the, the influences. So big T dink, Greg, whoever will watch the games and like they are on your screen in a room with you and they're watching the game and like reacting to the game. And I could go into their playback room and like hang out with them while they watch the game, while they're reacting to it. You can uh, see what oh, that's saying. cool. So, yeah, um, that, that's really interesting. Yeah. So it's so the the what I thought was cool about it, the, part of the reason I thought about doing it myself is if you are one of the people who has a room, you can give out 20 league passes. So for example, me, I'm in Minnesota. My friends in Minnesota who are big Timberwolves fans can't watch the Timberwolves because they're blacked out here. Those games are blacked out here. I could give out passes and they could actually watch them with me in the playback room. So there is, there's kind of some, some cool, it is, is a, the, a very is, cool. Is play. the pass you give them, it's like a one day pass or something. It's not like, is it, it's, they, you they can you can revoke it you can reset them whenever you want so like oh, you can give it to somebody you. and they just have it for forever but you can also uh reset if they're not there the next day whatever um yeah i'm i'm, I'm just watching on ESPN. Did, did i mention playback or um no i did i just, oh, okay, I just okay, knew I was it was like yeah yeah no that's i just i know it's, just, it's, it's, it's a place around. where you can watch games yeah gotcha yeah that's cool um yeah it's just hang on summary and i'll tell you um who i think are the highest expected winners in showdown i guess will be um what i can what i could share all right someone said a thousand dollar entry with 35 35 entries high stakes thousand dollar entry with 35 entries tier five mccarthy rose woods english recruiter so i think he's basically asking uh in a high stakes contest who would you who is going to project the best you cannot play woods um there's just it's just no no chance especially with the weather um you know the guy might have to play like more than 18 holes on friday and yes yeah. that is an adventure um it's it, i would say it's probably well mccarthy english kirk have all played really well so um though it was just between those three rose um has not played as well um recently i don't I don't know if he's. I don't know if there's any salaries related to that, but um, probably it's tiers, so there wouldn't. Be, I think, right? He said, oh, tier five, I gotcha. Yeah. Um, probably McCarthy is probably the the best player, though. It's it's close. I'd have to if this summary wasn't running. Um, I would look and see whether it's McCarthy, McCarthy English, or Kirk. Kirk has he was hot for a while, and then uh, um, he sort of cooled off a little bit. And English was coming off an, uh, a hip injury, I think, last year, and then okay. um, has come back and played pretty well. So it's it's the first one, four, or five are, are the are the toss ups. Um, no Brooks in the I see. So this is a good question, Ali E. Actually, how likely is it that a random lineup wins one that is insane? Um, <laughs> Jesse has actually, you know, he's caught a few of these as well, and I went back and I, you know, we've been looking. Um, this showdown season some of the most insane lineups have won contests i mean like literally in, in showdown or in in like- showdown pga um so oh here hey god i got the summary here one second um all right so I just love that you ran you ran your sims to to figure out who is on your PC. Well, I just had to I had to, I have all the so I'll tell you. So I've yeah. got the um showdown combined results here. And it's it's, it's me. three it's million three million seven hundred and sixty-eight thousand lineups. Jesus. Um okay. and so the person who's expected to win the most is uh Braden Gressith. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Um Mock Awesomeo can't fade me. All right, and that's then, a good list. Um, I would round I would round out the top 5 in my own sims very nice. surprisingly. Nice. Um but like Nerdy's up here whistles yeah. Jesse um 
That's interesting. Jesse's up there. That's uh, that's impressive because yeah. I mean, maybe Jesse does do Sims and stuff, and I don't know it. Uh, let me see, Jesse. So you know, like I said, uh, Jesse's average team scores less than the field. Average, yeah. His average team, and he's uh, expected to, um, you know, have a profitable um, ROI here. Hmm. Um, you know, there's, I mean, there's just a lot, you know, scouts on here, bro, bro flexes on here. Yeah. Uh, whistles, I think I said that. Sully bro <laughs> chill. Yeah. Um, has been a pretty good, you know, JVC, 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 you know, you know, I get, you know, we had the feud. Does he win where... every day though? That, that that's what just that's what just I mean I think that he actually makes good lineups so yeah. it's like I mean obviously you know yeah. it was just the representation of it was yeah. I thought was poor yeah. um like you gotta understand that the swings are are crazy um so to go back to this alley e comment one thing oh Braden okay hang on let me let me look before he pieces out here on those three guys um, Braden Roth are you are you B Greaseth <laughs> Braden Roth Damn, that's a sick no. sim model you got there. No, no, yeah, you have to have an E and Braden, I think. Oh, that's um, right, that's right. So tier five, let's see here. I'm going down. I see Tiger. Okay, Chris Kirk. Let's see what Chris Kirk, English, and who was the other one? Oh, McCarthy. McCarthy is like mega cheap though. I think on DraftKings. So so Kirk and English, I have them as like basically the same player. Um. Where the heck is Denny McCarthy at? Oh, right here. Wow, he's so cheap. I mean, I got Denny McCarthy quite a bit better player. Um, okay. But he's also, well, 35-man contest, I would just play the better player. Um, so Denny McCarthy is better than the other two guys. And Tiger is not close. And Justin Rose, um, also worse than the other three. So there's that. Um so to go one so one thing I do um to sort of uh per, calibrate my R, my expected ROI is every single showdown contest that I sim, I then break it into um fifth per, like five percentile buckets. Okay, so mm -hmm. every contest um, if you're one of the top 5% lineups in that contest, as far as EV, you know, you're getting assigned to group one and then the next 5% is group two, et cetera, et cetera, through 20 groups. This is your so overall every, lineup set, not your, not individual lineups or it, each, no, it's the individual lineups. Okay. okay. So um, every contest I'm bucketing the lineups into 5% buckets and like, what are the best five, 5% five lineups? What are the next 5%? Da, 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 da. Okay. So I have this summary, um, overall. And in general, the project the projected ROI for the buckets, you know, lines up pretty well. Like uh, the top bucket ROI over the whole sample is like twenty, or the projection is like thirty percent ROI. Yep. But lineups that end up in that bucket have an actual ROI of like twenty five percent. So if you can like submit lineups that end up in that bucket, you're in really good shape. Um, and this year, there has been multiple instances of lineups in the very last bucket winning huge GPPs. Huh. Like there was a lineup a few weeks ago. I think it. I think the total salary spend was forty two, five. Damn. And I had it projected was like four percent worse than the field that is like i can't even tell you how astronomical <laughs> this projection uh is and it somehow won i mean it was it was the create and it's not the first time that it's ha it's it's been a really weird year um in general the good players are doing okay in pga dfs but there have been um people that have had li or just lineups that were in that these lineups are complete garbage and they won 50, you, 100K. Do you think it would be possible to rate that poorly if you use the full salary or like within, you know, 500 no, no, of the full salary? No, it's not possible. No. Okay. It's not, so, it's not even remotely possible. Like if you funny. use, the, if you use the full salary, um, you probably like at 
worst negative uh, 40 percent 30 or 40 percent um so i mean you can still be you can still be pretty bad that's pretty bad 30 40 yeah. percent um but you'll see like the worst sims and the worst lineups in my sims will be like negative 75 and they'll just be like people that had just played off the wall or left a dummy lineup in or something or or a, sometimes you might see i've seen i've seen this crazy is like an insanely bad lineup that is duped like three times and okay. you're just like how yeah. in the world is this right. even i mean it's it's sometimes it's the craziest thing it's Wait, wild. you said so so negative four that would be negative 40 percent. What, what was this on that one it was worse than negative 40 percent. oh yeah it was here i'll i can i might be able to grab it real quick um let me see bye well, I, I can sort of show you uh, this. I don't think I'm giving away anything by doing this. Um, let me see. This is this will be much faster, I think. Hopefully, yeah. Um, yeah so uh, I don't know. I guess I could present, but I'll show you. I can show you one thing here. Hmm. Wait, if I give you, okay, let me see if I know how to give you presentation abilities. I don't think um, I know how to. Let's see. I think I can just click this. Okay. I'm guessing. I don't know what's taking. Um, normally, this is actually pretty quick. I have a version of this that I can um, show you, but I'll, I'll sort of. Um, but it's just, it's sort of like just a, again, a way, a way to calibrate, you know, are my are my sims like you know pretty good like are the are the lineups that i think are going to be winning money are they winning money are yeah the lineup like and then does it like sort of progress down uh, you know my my projected roi obviously will progress down through the buckets and over a long time period and i'm looking to see you know does the actual results um also reflect that and i right. feel like if 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 that is the case then if I'm peppering lineups into those top buckets that I think are are good, um, you know, if I can withstand the variance, then you know things hopefully would go pretty well for me. Yeah, absolutely. But so, are you, um, you you're trying to present something? I feel like uh, I, I haven't clicked need... the button yet. Oh, you have? Yeah. Not, okay. Okay. I have okay. not clicked the button yet. Um, I, 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 I have like... no idea if it'll work. Like, I, I feel like I need to give you some kind of permission, but I don't know. No, I, I, let's see. I, you might get a. Um, hang on, I might be able to get it another way. I think I have it saved somewhere. Okay. Um, let me just. Uh, and of course, audio listeners, I'm sorry, you are <laughs> yeah. out of luck. Yeah, you're you're out of. But we're not looking at anything right now, for the record. We'll let you know. No, nope, no, nope, nope. All right. Uh, da -da -da. Said it was copying it to a new spreadsheet. As far as I could tell. Now let's just do this. Um, I'm just going to open up Excel and set up a Google Sheet. I'm looking forward to it. The Timberwolves are also now tied. They went from ESPN is so off with their like odds of winning. They had the Timberwolves at 70% a couple of minutes ago. I'm like, and they were only up like six points. I'm like, there's no way they're 70% likely to win this game against the Nuggets. What are they at now? With Joker. It is now, uh, the Nuggets now have a 54.5% chance of oh, winning. Oh, no. You're in a real it's, sweat. It's in Denver. The game is tied. It's still third quarter, but yeah, I'm, I'm not how, um How close. How accurate do you think the those those uh very very far line? off? They're so okay. bad. Like like I mean like I said they they gave the Timberwolves a seventy percent chance of winning like three minutes ago when they had a five or six point lead. Like that that is not much of a lead at all. They're in I mean probably doesn't even matter if they're in Denver, but like I never felt like they had a better than fifty percent chance of winning even when they were up six in the third quarter. So um, yeah, I think I think they're pretty terrible. All right, let's see if this works here. Screen right. sharing. It's easiest with two. I'm looking at. I'm looking at the screen sharing tips now. Oh, nice. Okay. okay. Uh, did this work? I see your screen. Yes. I'm gonna okay. ask. Is it hell yeah? Okay, that worked. Okay. All right. So, uh, grouped by EV. So these are like 
the five percent best lineups, and then it you know it just cascades down. Obviously, yeah. if I move this, can you still see it? Yep. Okay, uh, so I can see the screen. Um, so the group one, all the lineups in that group, I project them to score one hundred point seven one percent of points versus the field. Yeah. Um, this is a 18 month sample or something like that. They've actually scored a hundred point nine, eight percent versus the field. So I project them to have a 42% ROI and they have a 26% ROI. So you can see like, obviously my projections, um, you know, just kind of roll down. Yeah. So you, you really have to be getting lineups in those first five buckets to be, um, profitable, which makes sense that that would be 20%. And so if 20% yeah. of lineups cash, as long as you're in the top 20%, you're probably making okay lineups. Um, and then the actual, you see the actual ROI jumps around a lot. Yeah, um, negative 13% in that. Yeah, it is, you know, people, those, you know, they haven't, yeah, buck. I mean, look, they haven't scored hardly any less. Oh, that's the yeah. projection. Um, they haven't scored hardly any, they scored more than the lineups in the next bucket. Um, yeah, it's not. And that's, that's just a, um, here I can open up one more second here. I'm going to, that's just like not getting the right golfers in the yeah, right line. Okay. So here, so here's a lot. I'm going to hide that stuff for a second. So let's just highlight this. So on the, yeah, you can see where, um, they're sort of dropping, uh, let's hide that. Okay. So yeah, where's the, where's the negative 13%? Uh, surprising. They've, so this is actual how many times they finish in the top 0.1 percent yeah um so they're finishing in the top one per, even top better than the sim hmm. yeah better than the sim right so the sim is says 0.3 so they just never get there first yeah they just they just aren't getting there um Interesting. but what i wanted to point out is look at the very bottom here two percent so like that's the that's the actual roi of that group of lineups and that is like such the biggest anomaly. I mean, look how many yeah, that points that these lineups score. And let me see if I can. Uh, dang, that thing is still dying. I'm not going to be able to get it. Um, I guess I can hang on. Um, I can get it this way. Uh, maybe not. Um, Nah, I won't be able to get it. But there, yeah, that's that, what's 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 crazy about that is in you know I'm obviously projecting those lines have negative sixty percent ROI. Right. Um, they're so they're like so far off the wall that they just absolutely cannot be good. And yeah. but they they, they have multiple fifty k plus wins, and they're just like there's a, like you look at the lineup, you're like. It might be a dummy lineup. There's just no, <laughs> they're, they're I'm not sure someone actually clicked this lineup intentionally. They just left it in there and fell asleep. Top one um, percent, actual 0.7 percent, simmed 0.47 percent. So they're getting in the top one percent, pretty significantly higher than in the sim. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, yeah, which is strange. And even more so for the top 0.1 percent. It's project uh, sim 0.03 percent, actual 0.07 percent. Yeah, and you can see like. There's there's probably something a little bit off there in uh, um, in that like I'm projecting them to score nine you know four percent off of the average and they're right. actually only scoring three percent off the average so um, you know there's some projection um, issue in there right. uh, but you know in general I look at I look at this a lot um, and 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 just say okay do the lineups that I think are good are they actually good? And then, right. you know, this appears to show, yes, that's the case. And so then I'm just like, okay, let's just keep peppering as many lineups as we can fit into, um, you know, the goal is obviously to get into those top, those top buckets. Yeah. If right. you can, if you can create the lineups that do that. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I don't, I don't know how many other people, um, you know, track the, track the results um, like that, but, to me, it just gives me confidence to just say like, okay, the process seems good. It's just, you know, I know there's going to be a ton of variance, but, um, let's just sort of, sort of ride with that. Yeah. Um, 
definitely just i think it's like just the the very top level players it's the the nerdy tenors the steve buzzard i know does stuff like this brick like not many people have the ability to track these guys like do this kind of this level of back testing i think right yeah yeah that's that yeah that's a you know the other thing i'll the other thing and i can show you is I'll, I'll delete these people's names um i won't show any names but um, should i remove this and let you share something else or is it uh uh yeah i'll let me I'll, I'll i'll pop up another another window here and and then we can maybe uh i might have to pop in some showdown lineups here but let's see here um one other thing that is insanely important is where you finish obviously in the top 10. so i yeah. masochistly track this uh unfortunately and uh just to sort of tilt my face off well you've um, kind of turned your luck around a little bit recently right I yeah mean... yeah that that's definitely the case um and uh let's see here I'm gonna hide that for now um and do this Braden says DFS is like poker. You need to be good, but you also need a lot of luck. I feel like you yeah. need a lot more luck in DFS than in poker. Yeah, like poker, I, like, I think yes, that's the definitely the case. Um, you definitely need to get stop screen, and then I'll start it again here. Um, no. All right. Can you see this one now? Did that work? Yes. Let's see it. Oh yeah. Okay. So yeah. I took out the usernames, but. Um, this is of the top volume players where when they, when they get into the top 10 where they finish and so you you know okay. you can see there's some unfortunate souls here that have not finished yeah. in first or second yeah um and then you have someone down here that when they get in the top 10 62 and a half percent of their finishes are either first or second yeah that's um, insane yeah so i look at this um and just and just say like okay uh you know th it's so important and had in place such a big role that you know we're talking about contest sizes that are five to ten thousand people and where you finish in in this top 10 is just so such such an important factor on like if you go to the yeah. top three percent, I mean, I, I, what one interesting one, one of the more is actually losing. One of the more interesting things. things that I've seen is tidbits that I saw. Uh, Steve Buzzard posted on Twitter at one point that one fifty maxers actually like get more of their lineups in first place when they're in the top ten than non one fifty. Or it was along those lines. Like like one fifty maxers seem to have like more control over finishing in first when they get near the top i maybe, maybe it was just variance but it seemed like over a large sample size i think that he posted on twitter at some point that he had data that kind of showed that like 150 maxers when they get to the top 10 are more likely to get to the the first spot hmm. I, I have not i have not found that um okay. to be the case interesting um so you you could you, you and i, I, I could look, totally be wrong i feel like he posted no, i mean it, you know it, it, it was it certainly was be a theory like that, that he had um no i mean it was based on whatever it was was definitely based on data it wasn't it was not based oh on, i gotcha not like a um, theory. one thing i you know it's it's fairly you know one thing i look at is top one percent rates and top 0 0.1 percent rates because they're fairly important and yeah. um you do see some people that have similar top one percent rates but have you know slightly different top 0.1% rate. Some of that's noise, but some of that is also, you know, just how they, how they play. Um, right. But, it, you know, but once you're talking, once you get down to here, the top 10, again, like on a golf is small, five, 5,000 person contest. I mean, you're in the top, top 1% is uh, 50 and then top 0.1% right. is the top five. Right. But like where you finish in the top five is so important. Um, for your results yeah. that um you know i sometimes just keep this up as like a a reality check and just say like okay um you know eventually you know you keep making it you know it, all of this all of this is just an exercise in 
trying to convince myself to continue playing. <laughs> yeah. And it, <laughs> luckily it has worked because like I said, like recently you've been absolutely crushing it. Yeah. It's just, you know, um, if, and, it, and you're getting to the point, I think where we're sort of on the back end of, I, I'm probably one of the largest pessimists in the DFS space. Um, mostly because I think it would, it can be a quick decline. Like, um, once you start to get, you know, you need a lot of MMEers to support these huge prize pools. Yeah. And once they start to peel off, the prize pools come down, and then it's like a cascading effect, um, really down to it will never go away, but you'll never also be able to, like, probably do it full time. It'll, right. And then the rake will go up, and it'll just be an entertainment product. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, it seems unfortunately. It seems likely. It, yeah, and, yeah, and it feels I like mean, we're moving in that. I mean, like it was one thing when, like, like I, I know I rarely MMA these days. I was MME and everything for a little while. That doesn't to me feel like that big of a deal because I don't have like a super advanced process. But then you hear people like Brick talking about like, yeah, maybe I won't MME anymore. Maybe now I'll start cutting back, trying to figure out which of my lineups, like not playing a full one hundred and fifty. To me, that is more concerning when it's like people with extremely advanced processes are, are pulling back. Seems like uh, it's a bad sign for the ecosystem. Yeah, I, I, and like I said, I think it, I think it just potentially has the it, it can be a cascading effect and just yeah. very quickly um, collapse um, because because of what is necessary to sustain the economy. Yeah, it just you know a lot of people have to be pumping a lot of money, in. and so once you know once the prize pools come down, then there's less incentive, and then it's sort of like something that feeds on itself essentially. Yeah. Um, um, Adam, Adam, to answer your question, I don't believe you're, you're sharing yeah. stuff behind the scenes right now. There's, none of this is is uh, cut sweat stuff. This is uh, yeah, cut sweat. Cut sweats, in my opinion, um, I try to keep it skill neutral. So yeah. I don't put anything on cut sweats that I think is is an edge that are edge related. Cut sweats is uh, entertainment product only for trying to like just ha make you have more fun playing pga dfs that that's the whole that's the whole goal of it it's yeah. just like can we enhance the sweat process or you know for for classic we have like the dashboard that just has all your players and we have a, a metric that sort of identifies when when events have a cut who are the most important players like in your lineups like who are the guys that are key to six of six who are the guys around the cut line that you have yeah. a lot of in a lot of lineups and so you know our goal is just like identify hey you're sweating the golf here's how we can enhance that sweat here's the guys you need um here's the lineup you need if you're playing showdown um that's that's sort of the goal of that i try to keep it i don't want to you know i'm not trying to make my opponents too much better <laughs> yeah you, you are uh sort of you're opposed to you're never going to be a tout it sounds like like you're kind of you don't really want to give away too much edges is, is the no. impression that i've gotten from you yeah are, are yeah. you are you anti-tout though are you like are you are you a, i mean you and i are friendly i, I guess I'm, I'm currently not a tout but like i i have been like um it doesn't seem no, like i mean i have to like you know I, you know from. i've met you know dink before and i you know i i you know i think generally people i get along with most people um yeah. uh so I, you know, I don't, I, I wouldn't say I'm anti-tout. I just, you know, sometimes I think that um, I would just prefer that it didn't exist. <laughs> right. uh, uh, but I can't even say because I did the same thing. Like I did the same thing for poker, but right, people make the comparison a lot. I think it's like significantly different in that you can teach people to play poker, but then they still have to they're go out and then make you. the decisions. For right. Themselves. Oh yeah. yeah. And they're and not competing here, against you directly, whereas like d touts for DFS, yeah, it's like, right. I'm yeah. giving you who I'm playing in this contest where I'm playing against you. As yeah, and the scalability, like, right, is way different. Yeah. Like you can yeah, teach yeah. someone at low stakes poker, they're not Im immediately going to come up and play high stakes versus you. But if you teach someone to play DFS and they have money, they can instantly become someone that plays in like every game. Um, so it's more similar to, I don't know, how into poker you did you play poker at all or are you i i played familiar? like recreationally i played played on full tilt for a while like while okay. I, i'd watch baseball games and play poker on full tilt and drink bourbon and i never got that good 
so it's like to me the more apt poker analogy is like nowadays and for the last few years um they call it rta which stands for real-time assistance which okay. are people using like sim products right at the table to play right. um and every single poker player that exists is against this you know they don't want that to happen because the people will be too good the computers are too good so you know the touting world is turning into let's create the best product possible that people actually use to play the game so yeah. it's like there's there's it you know eventually it'll be to the point where there's not going to be hardly any input necessary from the user it's just like you're sitting there with a poker sim at the poker table and it's telling you what to do yeah. and to me um you know that's not a great situation um Braden, i feel like this is a better question for me than for nelson yes in the tout eco and you can answer if you if you have thoughts on this too nelson but this is in the tout ecosystem is it actually genuine or is it like reverse psychology i can say in my experience i've never like done content with anybody that i thought was intentionally giving bad advice i i have done content with people who hold back a little bit um but like i don't i don't even hold back anything honestly I, i've shared people my with like my direct process at times and i think that most most touting is not it's definitely not reverse psychology. i think most touting is genuine like trying to give good advice uh, i think the worst that i've seen is people and it's not even bad just people like holding back you know some of their their best thoughts maybe is the worst yeah. i've seen do you have any different thoughts than that nelson nope i i would totally i would totally agree with that i don't i don't think anyone out there um is doing it maliciously is what yeah. i would say you know people are people do it for different motivations um right. you know i you know certainly there was when i did the poker training there was some aspect to just like being recognized or um you know having people know who you are that is a, a cool thing so right um or just something that some people you know strive uh, yeah. to achieve right. um some people want to help people um you know there's all the you know there's different motivations i i don't think anyone does it the, the people that i have the biggest issue with is people that um tout but don't play um you know right. so effectively in my mind effectively what they are doing is just passing on the risk to another individual right so like they don't want to take the financial risk themselves um they're just you know they're like hey you pay me a constant amount of money and then you take all of the risk uh, right. and handle the variance and that um, you know not as much so you're money. you're a skin in the game guy. i didn't know that you were a skin in the game guy you think if you are touting you should have some skin in the game of what you are telling people to do or yeah i mean it, i guess it depends on if you're touting if you're just like giving people data i don't you know i'm not sure that would qualify right but if you're giving people dfs or um advice for playing in actual dfs contests i think that makes it a little bit different yeah like there are some people that just provide data um i also don't i wish those people didn't exist as well i mean just right holistically not that i think they're bad people I, yeah i'm you know you just you know, wish they didn't run good taking away the edge yeah has a great like amazing products that these people put out that make um people's lives a lot simpler um right. that you know just make people better at the games that i'm playing against them in so it takes away that, the edge for the people like yourself who have put in the work who like you've put in all this work to gain this huge edge and then they're like but we're going to share similar data or like you know like we're going to share a percentage of what you have done with yeah. everybody else who's you know hasn't put in the work yeah i mean I, yeah i think that's yeah i think if you're giving direct advice on actually playing the game you certainly should have to you certainly should be playing it otherwise um you're sort of in my mind copying out and saying like well i could do it but i'd rather just sort of get paid steady rather than right um you know take 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 on some risk um yeah. so you're just passing the risk to someone who's willing to pay you for the information right um, so that, that that's yeah, the only that thing I, reasonable. I would say but i really don't think there's hardly anyone out there that's doing anything disingenuously or like maliciously it's yeah. just um, i mean there are people some, who just, you know like, some people just like other people's work for that kind of thing but yeah yeah i mean i would think some people just i think especially early on people may not have had the foresight to understand like how letting some of this stuff out 
into the wild would uh, ultimately affect their ability to play the game profitably. Right. Is what is what I would say because of the and that gets back to the scalability issue is like once someone you, you know it doesn't take a lot of people it does not take a lot of good players entering a DFS contest for them to eat literally all of the EV up. I mean, yeah. Uh, if if uh, five really good MMEers showed up, five new MMEers showed up in round one showdown tomorrow, they could significantly alter the edge of every other good player, like humongous. Like it, yeah. would, it would just be an astronomical adjustment. And it's even, I think um, it's even more so for like newer games or like games where there are fewer good players. Like the, the fewer good players there are in a specific type of contest, the more adding one is going to have like a huge impact. Whereas like, well, yeah, it would have a huge impact on the best player for sure. I mean, yeah. you might go from like, you got this unknown sport, UFL, you, uh, you know, spring UFL, football. I mean, that's it's perfect. You might exactly have a like, huge edge in it. Like, yeah. but one other Neil that figures that out is going to, right. you know, they're going to take away from your expected value. Yeah. That's, that's okay. where the, you know, you have all the expected value. That's where the lion's share of what they do is going to come from. Yeah. And to so, be clear, I'm, that, I'm not agreeing like that. Neil is the guy who has huge edge, but I'm agreeing with the concept of like, yeah, if you have like the more niche it is, the more it's like add a little bit of like, like great players to it, the, the more it takes away from any potential edge. Yeah. That's for uh, spring football yeah, is, like, then, is know, a great example, I, to be honest. Yeah, and I and I and you know yeah, the other the, now we're getting into the point where the variance is so high, like it's 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 sort of unfair <laughs> in some sense. You can't just go, oh well, this guy's been losing for six months. He sucks at DFS. Well, right. That that is no longer a yeah great player lose been, for six months probably yeah. for a while. Yeah. It's not been an indication that the person stinks at DFS. It's just right. It's it's just brutal out there. I mean. Uh, I don't know what edges are expected to be in some other sports, but PGA might be like classic 20, 30% expected. That seems really high. high. Damn. Uh, okay. I would think in, in classic, the best people probably could, that's probably their expect, expectation. Showdown, it's lower just because it's smaller prizes and um, a little bit more competition. Um, but, you know, you, you could be a 30% ROI guy and definitely lose for much, much longer than anyone has even thought possible. Right. So, um, um, so I, that's, I, I used to be like, oh yeah, let's just, uh, you know, if you're, if you're behind, if you have stuff behind the paywall, your, your results should be transparent. I, I think it's good for people to know, but also people could interpret it very incorrectly. It right. just, um, Here are my so actual it's, results. It's, yeah, it's some. Yeah. It's sometimes not. You know, sometimes would not be fair. So, yeah. right. I've sort of it's, softened on that a little bit. <laughs> I think that uh, yeah, it seems reasonable to. And it may, maybe at one point it was more reflective of your actual play. Like there was a point where probably if you were good, you would win. Like like oh yeah, right. Or, and and like, that has changed substantially. Yeah, probably I would like. I it would be really interesting. I think to how large of an effect COVID had on things because literally nobody had anything to do. That's and true. I if it was like, all right, I guess I'll focus on my DFS. Yeah. yeah. I wouldn't, I would not be um, too surprised um, if that you sort of accelerated it, you know, yeah, it's, it accelerated things. I never thought about that, but you're probably right. It probably did. I mean, there was no sports going on. So, you know, Hey, you really couldn't like just play more. You could just, think about it and Plan, like yeah okay yeah you could like how could i get better right um i think for sure golf um changed quite a bit in 2021 um sort of realm but interesting um, um all right we, we are getting to the end here I, i'm right. not going to keep you we've got over three hours i think, we're, <laughs> I think we are, we're closing in on an hour longer than the second longest episode which which is awesome uh but yeah, I, I do uh, want to talk uh braden says it's like those Yuda interviews where he just dodges every question. He was, I honestly, I didn't think he dodged all that. Like, I thought he was pretty straightforward. I think that I, I've said this before. I think that I believed him more than others in part because my process is, is closer to his than like the, the top players. So, so maybe I'm just hopeful that like, oh yeah, that's just all he does. He just like, 
you know, knows he uses projections and knows ball essentially. I know that yeah, a lot of people I, are very skeptical. So I, I, I think I was pretty skeptical of it. Yeah. Um, I, I found it extre- extremely odd some of the things um, that he was saying. But you know, I don't know. Maybe, maybe it just is. I mean, you can't deny. I mean, what the guy's results are. So right, um, he crushes. I, you know, in my old age, I, as I get older, you know, certainly one of the things you learn is like to have a much more open mind. And like, yeah, I, tr- you know, try to talk to a lot of guys uh, about different things and just be open to okay, you do it differently. Um, you know, rather than being like okay. Well, that's wrong. Fish. Like, yeah, right. yeah, like, yeah. okay, you know, how, why is that, like, why is that the case? Or, you know, could you think about something, um, you know, differently um, than you had before? Just, there's so much more benefit to being open-minded than yeah. closed-minded. Yeah, Just, no, absolutely. And But I think it's an age thing. I think it's like, you know, when you're young and whatnot. Um, right. You think you know best, and if you do it differently... Uh, you're you're wrong or you're lying about what you do. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that it's as you get older, you you start to understand that like there are a lot of different ways to, to do these things, and they're not necessarily wrong, even if they're not necessarily best practice. Um, yeah, I, I didn't think they do. Yeah, wrong. I mean, it, the, it could be totally wrong, but it could like it could be like a a moment where you're like, okay, they might not be thinking about this in particular correctly, but it sort of like opened my eyes to like if they just made this one tweak. Maybe it would right. be really good. Yeah, yeah that's um, interesting. So, um, it's you know, I think it's help. You know, in this, in this, you know, you certainly have to be protective of your edge to some extent, um, but it certainly is useful to have some people to um, bounce ideas off of and, and and talk to for sure. Yeah. All right, Nelson. Well, we're, we're gonna we're gonna do the the closing out part, but we gotta the, the thing that I always ask at the end of these shows that I want to ask uh, that I want your um, response to is uh, tell me about your favorite win and or win celebration. And if you have multiple that are close, you can tell me about multiple. But I want to hear like your favorite win in DFS or you know wh- whatever. I guess if you oh, I mean my favorite, favorite one is easy. Um, it was on the on my birthday because uh, like two months ago. Don't, yeah, my parents don't live here uh, or where I, you know, they live back in Virginia where I'm from, but they were visiting um, surprise for my birthday and we were playing golf. Um, so I had, I had, I brought my, la- I had to bring my laptop in the, you know, my dad drove to the golf course. So, but I had to like make some lineups in the car and submit them. And then um, the, the slate I actually won that day was, from the day before the, like it had gotten delayed so oh that's right that's right it was, okay. i think it i think it was delayed and so it was a continuation of the previous round so it sort of ended like in the middle of the day and um it just like right when we were coming off the golf course i had been sort of following it on my phone and um i was just you know talking i was playing golf with my dad and a, a good friend of mine um and i was just like look if this guy misses this putt you know or it doesn't make birdie on this hole, we're going to, I'm going to win. And um, so it was fun just to have, you know, well, all the other wins that I've, I've never been really um, around people. Yeah. Um, I've had some like crushing, like not really crushing defeats, but like, okay. If, like I can distinctly remember, like I needed Bubba Watson one time to make, well, I didn't know at the time, but he made a triple on the last hole or okay. a double on the last hole. And I, or no, it was a triple because it was round four. And and really, normally in showdown, double is the max score. Like, if you score more than double, you can't lose any more points. But in round four, you can lose finish points. Oh, yeah. Uh, if you move down one more right. spot. And at some point, I realized, like, I just needed Bubba Watson to make double on the last hole to win a showdown slate. Oh, and God. he made a triple. <laughs> and, uh, that is like, brutal. And so, I, it, you know, you think of the losses. Um, way more but the win yeah. was good with you know just had family and friends um, did, did you know coming into the day like what, what did you I, I assume you knew your odds coming into the day of winning that uh round. yeah i win. that i did um because the round was like 75 percent over so i oh, knew 75 percent. okay yeah i knew going into the day um that i had i had like 20 percent win equity in the contest or something okay. like that so i i knew we were sweating on the golf course um, but we were sort of just like following it around. 
Yeah. So that 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 was that was my favorite win for sure. That is awesome. Um, yeah, everybody in chat now is saying good luck in the Masters tomorrow. Of course, doesn't apply to uh, to the audio listeners, but good luck in life to the audio. I guess maybe if they're listening early enough, good luck uh, in the Masters to everybody. Hopefully, yeah. Nelson can can turn his fifty thousand win from last week into some big wins this week as well. Nelson, I've really appreciated you coming on. This has been an awesome conversation. Um, yeah. Where where can people find you? Well, uh, Twitter would be the number one place uh, at Nelson Adcock. Um, my DMs have forever been open, so anyone can uh, reach out to me. Um, and then if you are sweating uh, PGA lineups, you can go to cutsweats.com and hopefully um, enjoy it a little bit more. So um, if you play classic or showdown, we sort of cater to both. All right. Thank you again, Nelson, for coming on episode eight of Playing for Keeps. Thank you to those of you who have been hanging out with us. This has been a, a long conversation. You've been here for a long haul, so really appreciate you hanging out with us. And of course, thank you to audio listeners as well. If you haven't already subscribed to the YouTube channel, I'd appreciate it if you would do so. Like the video helps me out quite a bit. And uh, I think episode nine should be next week. I'm guessing it'll be Wednesday night. I have not scheduled that one out yet, but should be probably next Wednesday night. Um, I'll let you know when it is. Thank you for hanging out and I'll catch you next time.